Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. I recognize some faces from last year, which is always good. Because I think if they ask me to come back, it means I'm at least doing a good job, at least last year. So I'm going to try and do the same this year. So it's going to be about Microsoft DevOps solutions, which I think is one of the first non-existing Microsoft products. There is no Microsoft DevOps solution product. There's two of them, and I'm pretty sure that all of you know about it. I'm not going to do a sales pitch, definitely not. I'm not going to try to defend one compared to the other, because I think it's hard. So I'm going to share my view, like I'm doing every week and delivering about the same, but spread over four days. So my first challenge is going to be cramming all that content in just three hours and a bit. Next to that, they told me it's a workshop, which means you need to do some work as well. You all got your laptops with you? Good. It's going to be challenging to do four days of content in three hours and a half, including four laps where each lap is 30 minutes. But we'll manage, if you help me a little bit, right? So first of all, I think I need to thank the sponsors. Um, you know them. If you see them, just grab them by the hand and thank them for sponsoring the conference. And if you want to try something out, I would say give it a try. There's a big reason why they're here. There's a big reason why the conference is possible. And that I know you still need to pay for it. I get it. But at least they're contributing quite a bit. So just when you see them, thank them for that. That's like the least I think we all can do. The agenda is interesting. Why do I say that? Because I got three options. This is the first one. It's where I'm going to talk about one of the most interesting parts from the last couple of years. Azure DevOps is that. I'm going to try and convince you that it's not that. Or maybe not yet. Or maybe not at all. We'll find out. Second is how to do DevOps. I know that a lot of you are probably way more experienced in PowerShell than I am. But that's fine, because I'm covering the second part of the conference, and that's DevOps. That's my playground for the last couple of years. I'm going to try and help you moving from what you're doing every single day in PowerShell and how to make it more DevOps ready. Anyone already using DevOps? Cool. Anyone using Azure DevOps? Anyone using GitHub? GitLab? No GitLab. Oh, there's one GitLab. Cool. Octopus Deploy? Cool. Team City? Manual PowerShell script from your local machine? <laughs> All of you, right? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> the second part, the third part is, how do we integrate them? I told you it's Microsoft DevOps Solutions. Yes, we got two products, and we try to align them. Where interesting enough, I'm still one of the few ones, actually, talking about how to bring those two worlds together. And again, it's not that I'm so great. It's just because I started a long time ago with DevOps in TFS. Anyone remember TFS? Or still using it, maybe? Yeah? No, not anymore. Glad you're not doing that anymore. <laughs> you were so happy about that. Cool. Um, I adopted DevOps, I think, seven, eight years ago, where I wanted to automate myself for my job. And I'll talk about that. And then, obviously, there was GitHub. And Microsoft acquired them. And there's two philosophies. There's two streams. And I think there should only be one. But I'm not part of the product team, so I cannot really influence that. But I think the best is bringing the best from each product together. And that's what I'm going to try and help you understanding as well. And then wrapping it up with a little bit on security, because there's no DevOps without security. And then Q&A. And in between, a little bit of hands-on labs, if you want to. That's what I prepared. But then I thought, like, wait a minute. It's four days of content crammed in three hours and a half. Maybe in between, we need to do a break. And then we also need to do some labs. So I could shift the previous agenda into you doing more work. I got four laps and a half. The half one is just onboarding to Azure and DevOps. And then Peter being a bit more quiet and you doing more work. Wow, that sounds exciting. <laughs> OK. So luckily, I had a third agenda where I'm like, you know what? We're all technical. And we all got questions. So why not just open the floor for questions? And you're going to build the presentation for the next three hours and a half. I got the labs on GitHub, so you can go through them whenever you want. 
They will be available for as long as I keep my repo on, which probably will be forever. <laughs> so you don't have to do labs. I just give you three options. So who's in for option one? No one. So why did I prepare three weeks and a half for this? <laughs> okay. Option two. Cool, cool. Option three. Everybody else, then, right? So what about who did not raise their hand? Like, you don't care. You're just like, it's Monday morning. I'm here. You should be happy already. I know. Yeah, we've, we've already forgotten the options. You know there's a button for this. It's like, really? Three on one single slide? You really want it? No. <laughs> so it's going to be or me talking a bit more. And it's not talking. It's doing quite a lot of demos. I got a few slides. But typically, I'm presenting without slides. Now, I know that the setup is a bit weird, or different at least, than working from home with seven screens and some nice tablets to write on. So I'm not going to try and do that, although I might actually still try and do that. But should we try something in the middle, like starting and see how it goes? And then obviously, you can ask questions whenever you want. Even if I go like, well, I'm going to talk about this, or oops, sorry, forgot about it, then it's still a valid question. Sounds good? Cool, cool. And remember, we still got the three options. So at some point, you go like, well, this is too much. We want to play a bit. Then we can shift to some lab and hands-on time as well. Cool. So I'll share a bit about myself. I'm Peter Detender, uh, originally from Belgium, but moved to Redmond about two years ago. Actually, my in-person presentation the first time uh, right after COVID was the PowerShell Summit two years ago in the other hotel. Working at Microsoft with probably one of the most clear job titles within Microsoft ever, it's an Azure technical trainer. So guess what I do? I provide technical training every single week to our top four or 500 customers worldwide. Used to be traveling every single week to some fun place in the world, but then obviously with COVID, it moved to virtual and it's still virtual, which allows me to get different customer impressions. Because the way customers are using technology is different in the super small Belgium than moving to Europe and moving to the US and now talking to global customers. So I think, although I like seeing real 3D people, right, it's still hard to like every now and then shift back. But that's the benefit of the virtual world. So what got me into um, DevOps, I told you, was automating myself. Come on in. Good morning. I needed to automate myself because before I moved to Microsoft five years ago in the trainer role, I was running my own company together with a few other ones, providing training, consulting, migrations, um, helping customers and partners onboarding to Azure. Now, Microsoft was my biggest customer. They hired me to like, talk to customers like yourself. And when they started their internal trainer team, I was like, hmm, I'm going to lose my business. So it might be easier to join them instead of trying to fight them and lose my customer. So I joined them, and that's um, what I did five years ago. Now, why did I talk about automating myself? Because I needed to provide demo scenarios. I needed to provide lab environments for customers, redeploying proof of concepts. And there's no way you can do all of that in like an 80-hour week and traveling across the globe. So I needed to find something to automate. I got my PowerShell scripts. I got a few other things right. And then I discovered TFS. And I was like, whoa, that's for developers. I'm not going to touch it. But then gradually moved into Azure DevOps, and in between, there was like Visual Studio Online, right? And I was like, cool. I got my PowerShell scripts, the ones that I already have. I got my Azure command line scripts. I got everything that I need. And now I'm just going to glue them and stack them together. And that's a pipeline. And that's like one of the first things that got me into Azure DevOps. And I love the product so much that I decided to focus most on Azure DevOps out of my training deliveries. That's a benefit. I can choose what I'm training customers on. There's a set of trainings we need to provide every couple of months. And I was like, well, Azure DevOps is my playground. It helped me building, expanding my company. So why not sharing that message to customers? And then eventually still training on it. And then a bit of free time, which is honestly not that much. It somehow still pushed me back to technology. So I've been publishing books. I try to still be active in the community. like this week, helping you understanding technology and learning from you as well. And then every now and then publishing books, although the last one was almost uh, two years ago on Azure Site Reliability Engineering. 
It's getting recorded, so I cannot say that you can get a free copy, but you probably figured that out how to do that. Good. So the first part, if you think about your DevOps cycle, and obviously the Microsoft DevOps solutions, is where do we start? Like I could give you the scenario like a Monday morning, it's a four day Azure 400, that's our exam certification. And customers ask me like, are we doing Azure DevOps 100%? I'm like, no. They're like, why not? That's what my company is gonna use. That's what they want me like to get certified on. I'm like, well, there's Microsoft DevOps solutions. There's a lot more than just Azure DevOps. So one of the first things is how do we decide? And you can probably already figure out from the topic of the session that it's not gonna be one or the other, right? But again, who's using Azure DevOps? And be proud about it. Come on, you can do that. Most of you, cool. Who's using GitHub? And I'm talking about like enterprise ready, like company decisions. There's no decision, no? A little bit getting started. And is the plan to migrate everything over or? I'm sure that's why this is kind of a oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to go back to agenda one, two, and three in the back of my mind. Like, what are the topics I need to talk about, right? Cool. So yes, there is Azure DevOps with a whole bunch of features. I'm gonna try and highlight the best of them. And it's not the Microsoft best important. It's what Peter thinks are the most useful features. I love Azure DevOps, that's pretty clear. I do love GitHub as well. But I love when you bring those two together. And it's every now and then it's, it's a bit clumsy, it's a little bit refabricating, and I think that's fine because that's also part of just doing DevOps. But then there's that rumor from like five years already. Oh, we acquired GitHub and there's no roadmap for Azure DevOps anymore. The funny thing is that even today I'll share the link, there is still a roadmap, at least for the next 18 months. And you might go like, oh, what does that mean? Like, is there a dead end in 18 months from now? No, they never really look further than 18 months and that's what they did for the last 12 years in the product. So it's not that. There's no official news. Again, there's a lot of rumors, but that's been the same for the last five years. On the other side, yes, it's coming. And I'll show you some integrations where again, it's not deciding one or the other. Now the big question obviously is, what if you're not using any of those tools today? That's why I was asking like GitLab and TeamCity and Octopus Deploy and all the other ones. And at some point you wanna move into that Microsoft DevOps world, like which way to go? I don't know. That's also what I wanna to share today, to give you some ideas that in the end, DevOps is about the culture. It's Automating yourself, it's providing value to your business, which could mean a lot of different things for any different organization. And that's what you need to find. And the good thing is there's probably always a feature in some of the tools that's gonna to help you moving from point A to point B. And then at some point you're gonna decide which one works better. We all like to drive a car, but every now and then I like to be in a Porsche instead of like the little Jeep that I'm driving. But in the end, I just wanna go from point A to point B. And then sometimes you think about like, well, maybe I should get a, I don't know, like a helicopter and there's no traffic jam anymore. Or waiting for the flying cars and we still don't have them. That's what I promised in my cartoons 25, well, no, no Peter, 38 years ago. Okay, cool. <laughs> Back to DevOps, right? So there's more than 25 features getting announced and actually got announced only last couple of weeks. Anyone know some of them? Is that something that really worries you, like as a Azure DevOps customer, like what's the roadmap of the product? Or you go like, I'm not really interested in it. Yeah. I'm gonna try and switch. Look at that. We don't need AI to do all this. We can do this manual. Cool. I'll share the link. Uh, no, I'll share the deck. And then in the deck, there's the link to the DevOps roadmap. I'm not gonna read from it, but if I just scroll and scroll and more scroll, you go like, well, it's not impressive but that's because I like scrolling fast. Each and every of these items, and if you count them, yes, I did, 52 of them. Good morning, come on in. 52 of them, that's the roadmap. Does that mean that in the next three, six, 12 months, it's gonna be a dead product? I don't think so. And then there's obviously the same from the GitHub site. You could go through and go like, oh, this one is shorter. What does that mean? No, it's just that they have less links but there's a lot more in the pipe. So the good thing is, but we're still not there, that Azure DevOps is not that, GitHub is there and we try to embrace them. 
So the next step is like, what are the strengths of each product? If you ask me, I think the look and feel, the layout, I know the portal based experience, right? In Azure DevOps is better. But what does that mean? It's not gonna convince your CEO or CFO to buy and go one or the other. So we need to find something else. I think Azure Boards, the project management, and I'll walk you through some demos later on, is still one of the more complete experiences. It's like how you do DevOps from a non-technical perspective, right? It's where your Scrum lead maybe, or your DevOps lead, or maybe yourself are working and organizing your projects. There is GitHub projects. It's having the same purpose, but the look and feel, the experience, I would say it's less complete. But maybe Azure Boards is too much overkill for you. Maybe you're starting small with like your first DevOps onboarding project. We go like, oh my God, Kanban boards, Scrum, Agile. I have no idea what it is. And then maybe what you find in GitHub projects is more than good enough. Make sense? Then obviously Azure Pipelines, I think one of the strengths that the product had was what we now call classic interface. It was a graphical interface like the Microsoft look and feel, right? How to build your pipelines. If you don't know how to compile, I don't know, like a .NET or any other language product, where well, you need to install the NuGet package manager, you need to run .NET build, .NET compile, .NET whatever, right? There was a pipeline that could help you dragging and dropping and ta-da, magically it worked. And then in GitHub, it's all code-based. A little bit harder to get started, right? And then obviously the other challenge now is like, well, we started with classic pipelines. How do we now move them into YAML? Because it's all YAML. You can still do classic pipelines. It's still there, but if you onboard, like let's say you're a new customer, you onboard, there's no classic option anymore at first. You can still enable it, but you need to go into your DevOps organization settings and then drilling down and then somewhere you find like, oh, I can go back to classic. I don't think there's a real need to go back to classic, but there's a big challenge for customers running classic pipelines and getting them moved into YAML. And we might do an exercise on that. That artifact is where you store your custom developed or the, the company secured flagged packages. Instead of allowing your developers or DevOps team, right? to go to the public NuGet package managers or any other for any language, you could validate them, test them, control them, lock them down, and then publishing them to your team from your internal artifacts. And yes, the same in GitHub. Test plans is where you're gonna test and inject testing plans for your applications. Still one of the biggest strengths, I guess, on the DevOps side, but it's also a lot more expensive. But if you're using it, pretty, pretty cool. And then Wiki's creating your documentation the same on Azure platform. Then obviously if I talk about Azure DevOps, I need to talk about like what makes GitHub so great. I think it's the community behind it. That's the biggest part. There's, I remember like a sales pitch or a sales slide a few weeks ago where I think they reach a pretty big number of developers. I personally don't like that because I'm not a developer, I'm a DevOps engineer. I know I'm a trainer, but sometimes I feel like a DevOps engineer still. So when they talk about like we're targeting developers, I think they need to broaden the spectrum a little bit to make sure that everybody is part of the game. But that's details. It's the community. Why? Because it's so easy to get started. You go to github.com, you create an account, and bam, you're in. You create a repo, you move some of your scripts, your PowerShell, your documentation and wikis and whatnot, and it's gonna work fine. But moving to Azure DevOps is again a little bit harder. That's also the free account. Interesting enough, the backend, like once you start running pipelines, they're technically running the same virtual machines. The funny thing is, and I'll try to show you, when you go into Azure DevOps, you run a pipeline, it connects to a virtual machine running in Azure that we call Azure DevOps Agents. There's no agent, it's just a little tool that you install on the machine, that's the agent. Where GitHub calls it a runner. Now if you run that pipeline from Azure DevOps, the virtual machine is now displaying like I'm a runner. A few weeks ago I had a customer telling me like, wow, we moved to GitHub because my pipelines were running faster. I was like, interesting. Because it's technically the same virtual machines. 
So they should not run faster. And actually, they didn't. It was just that they removed some of the parts that they could not do in a GitHub pipeline. I was like, well, that's cheating. But GitHub Enterprise, that's where you move up from, I would say, the not the free edition, but like probably the step-in model to make it more corporate ready with a whole bunch of new features. GitHub APIs, uh, the GitHub command line could be a good one. So there's, again, a quite impressive roadmap. And then one of the, the coolest ones, to me at least nowadays, is GitHub Copilot. I know we can joke about Copilot for as long as you want, but it's there, it's not going away. And besides the cool thing about the technology, and yes, I got a demo on it, is Copilot on its own. Anyone not using it yet? Why not? No, makes sense. You need to pay for it. Unless you go to copilot.microsoft.com, you copy paste, and then, oh, looks, it's producing code. Remember how I talked about migrating your classic pipelines to YAML? Copilot might help you with that, sort of. And then the latest one, so cool because Chris actually talked about it when we were talking here five minutes ago. Last week, Thursday, April 4th, GitHub announced Azure Private Networking for your runners. The first question that we got from all customers was, what about Azure DevOps agents, the virtual machines doing the job right? We're like, we don't know. It was not on the roadmap. Nobody announced it. But now it looks like GitHub has it. By the way, this is a big one. If you think about like how your organization is typically using the, the built servers, let's try to speak generic, right? It's or you're going to use the ones that Azure provides. And your security teams typically freak out, like, wait a minute, what are you doing? You're Git cloning my source code that my developer team was creating into your VM, my dear Microsoft. Are you serious? We're not going to do that. We're going to build our own servers. That's what we call self-hosted, right? And then you still need to decide, like, where are we running them? Are you running them in Azure? Are you running them on-prem? Are you running them wherever? Or, and if it's not a VM, in the meantime, you could use containers as well. But those VMs are running somewhere. So most customers were deploying self-hosted, meaning we're going to add a lot more administration into our direction because of that network security limitation. Because in the end, it's still public cloud compute. And our GitHub runners, since last week, announced Azure Private Network. So if you got ExpressRoute or VPN from your corporate network, corporate headquarters network into Azure, you can now directly connect to your runners as well using the same flagged secured by your security teams. I did a demo already on the roadmap. Cool. Now back to the start, it's about the culture. What is the culture of DevOps? Anyone? Break down the barriers. Breaking down barriers, yep. No walls between developers and ops. Yep, providing value to the business. That's part of our Microsoft definition from a couple of years back. But in the end, you could almost say, like, as long as we get from point A to point B and the company is happy, the company is making money, right? Who cares what tools we're using? If your manual PowerShell scripts or Azure CLI, or, and yes, I know it's not just Azure, right? But if you get from point A to point B and you're happy in the way it works, that's fine. Your customers or your users don't care if you publish that new application using Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions. Most probably they don't know anyway how you do that. But the internal team collaboration is a big one. It's also why, again, that decision, should we go for solution one or two, is a hard one. Even asking three agenda options and asking which one is the best, you don't even help me with that. So the official definition from a couple of years ago, but it's still valid, is bringing people together, thinking about a streamlined, aligned process without overthinking, is it agile, is it scrum, and then providing value to your business, and users, customers, whatever that works. So again, in my personal example, before I moved to Microsoft was providing lab environments. I could start a deployment, well, no, the backend started an automated deployment, and I knew that when I walked in my classroom at 8.30 in the morning for like 20, 50, 200, sometimes more than 800 people, that my lab environment was up and running. 
where before automating myself, I was typically traveling on a Saturday back to Belgium and then leaving again on a Sunday or flying in on a Friday, leaving on a Saturday, depending where in the world I needed to be on a Monday, and then arriving in some place, hoping that the hotel Wi-Fi was good enough, and then running 20 deployment scripts or 50. And that typically meant that Monday morning, 8 o'clock, my eyes were like, mm, because I spent the whole night deploying my VMs. And I know it's like an easy example, but yes, that was my reality. Or like quickly trying from Wi-Fi on a plane to run some deployments. And I know technology is cool. I mean, it allowed, I loved it and it allowed me to do that stuff. But on the other side, you're like, I don't want to deal with this anymore because it's not scalable and it's not repeatable. So that's why we need DevOps. We're now back to the solutions. That's an easy slide. I'm not going to read out all the bullet points. But again, the good thing is you got five cycles. The planning phase, that's what your typically solution architects are working on. They think about what is the solution we need to implement. We need a retail website. We need some database behind it. We need whatever, not too important. We need to provide a service. Next to that, your development team and the DevOps team is going to build something. Developers write code, and you write PowerShell scripts or any other scripts. I'm pretty sure you're all PowerShell oriented, but probably not just PowerShell, right? And then once you have your code, you're going to test it. You're going to compile it. Come on in. We're still in the marketing pitch, so you didn't miss anything. <laughs> you're going to release it, which means moving into a running state. And as you can see, while, you're, while I'm talking, you're reading all the bullet points. There's a solution in two worlds for anything in the DevOps cycle. But then also looking at blending those two worlds together. So easy said, you might use Azure Boards, the project management. That's why it's up there on the planning phase. And then you're going to use some writing tool, coding tool, which could be Visual Studio VS Code and yes, Eclipse and IntelliJ and all the other ones are also fine. We don't care. Or why not using GitHub code spaces? Anyone using that? Like the VS code from the cloud? Not really. It's convenient, I think, but I like my, no, I actually don't like my local machine. But that's detail. That's for your breaks. And then you might use Azure repos, or you might use GitHub repositories. They're doing the same thing. They're Git based, so yeah, who cares? And then you're going to move to running a pipeline. Everything that you can do in Azure DevOps pipelines is possible from GitHub Actions and the other way around. And they're using YAML. Anyone loving YAML? Really, you love YAML? Nice. That's true. Sometimes, depending on your experience level. I think the classic one, and I mean, it's obviously where we started like seven years ago. There was no YAML. And then GitHub Actions, oh my god, YAML, ah, scares me away. It's so hard. It's not possible. Let me go back to my trusted Azure DevOps where I can drag and drop and click and do. But the world is changing, so we need to change as well. And then eventually, you're going to bring everything together. And again, we're still not there. You need to decide which one. Sounds good? Liking it so far? Cool. Anyone more interested in Git? That's in room 402. No, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about Git as well, so you can stay. I have no idea what the other sessions are about. Cool, so the planning phase, step number one in your DevOps cycle. So I told you Azure Boards, to me, is a bit more mature than GitHub Projects. But again, GitHub Projects is not wrong. So don't go out and go next week, probably, back to your office like, oh my god, Peter, the guy from Microsoft. If you mention it like that, it's still fine. But if you go next week back to the office and go like, oh, Microsoft told this last week, no, that's wrong. So what is Azure Boards? It's the project management tool. For basic, you just open it up, you create a project, and from there you're going to add work items. That's the stuff that you get in your boat every week. Like, hey, we want you to work on this. Could be a few ones, could be like an overload, and then you're going to move it to a backlog. And then your project manager team or the Scrum lead, or whatever name the person has, is going to watch over. That's what we call Kanban boards. Oh, my team is working on this. My team is not working on everything else. And then gradually, they, we're going to move stuff from the need to happen, it's in progress, to, oh, it's done. And that's still pretty manual. But you can automate that as well a little bit. Mapping the two platform screenshots all cool. I'll show you live how that works. 
Okay. Who's using boards as their prime management tool? Oh, well, like half of you, cool. Uh, over here. So the starting point is, let's start with the basics. Um, an Azure DevOps organization. Think of an organization as the highest level. You can have one, you can have multiple ones. My organization is called PDT Demo World because that's what I use for um, all my demos. Within your organization, you build a project. A project can be anything. Once you deploy or create a project, it's gonna give you access to all Azure DevOps features. But maybe you don't need all of them. Maybe you don't need artifacts because you're not using your custom controlled managed packages. It's there, you can disable it, but that's details. So I got a whole bunch of projects and I'll probably switch uh, across multiple of these where the starting point would be boards where you can define, this is what my team is working on. Obviously in the back end, it's um, Azure Active Directory, Entra ID now as one of the user base options allowing you, like my unassigned, I still have no idea who's that, um, or defining work item for myself. If you're into the official DevOps project management, meaning Agile Scrum, or a deviation of that, you can define that from the start. And if you want to start basic and eventually moving up, you can do that as well. That's what all these different um, options stand for. Make it a little bit bigger. So you could define a bug, like something's not working as it should be, we build it, it worked fine, and all of a sudden, not anymore. An epic is like a collection of all the other ones, but that's details. So you're gonna create your work item, you're gonna assign it to someone. I'm not gonna bore you with a demo how to do that. I hope it's pretty obvious. But if not, raise your hand, let me know. More than happy to show you some stuff. Now within the boards overview, that's what I talked about, the Kanban scenario. So you got all the different tasks that your team is working on. And from here, you're gonna move them, you're gonna drag them around, and it's gonna update the status. That's all happening in the back end. Cool. If you expand, this is in the way. Can I remove this left side? No, probably not. That's fine. I'll move this a little bit to the right side, cool. So you can link it to your Azure repos. Makes sense because it's the same product because you're typically gonna have your project management in Azure DevOps, and you're gonna store your source code and scripting code and everything else in the same Azure DevOps project. Now you can cross link, so you could create like one project for boards doing the project management and still linking to source code repos out of a different project because it's still part of that same organization. Outside the organization is a little bit harder, but that's why we got GitHub to the rescue, but I'll show you that later on. So here you could link, you could point to your repo, any of the ones in your organization, and then flagging like what kind of code do I want and what is my um, commit message that happened. So pretty default source control integration. And then we have a backlog, where the backlog means we have a sprint. What's your typical sprint window? Is it a week, three weeks, six months, two weeks? Okay, when did we shift back from three weeks to two weeks? I remember a long time ago, it was always like, you know what, take three weeks, that's like the safe spot. But it looks like for you, the pressure is a little bit higher. Cool, we're making progress. <laughs> Anyone doing less than two weeks? I've done one week. What's that? I've done one week. One week. Was that for something you knew you could finish in a week? It was not five weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Typically not, right? <laughs> Typically not. I would say, I mean, my explanation is like, start with three weeks and obviously it's just the number. If it's four weeks, if it's three months, that's probably still fine. But I think three weeks is doable because it, you typically know like, what is my team already working on? You typically know like, is this feasible? And next to that, it's not the super long roadmap to explain to your marketing teams or your business teams or your CTO, CFO, like, oh, we're still working on this, but there's no progress. So that's like three weeks seems to be the fine one. Next to that, you're probably gonna work, that's the other question that sometimes comes up, like what about the work items? How do you define them? Do we need one work item for one task? Do we need one work item for, you need to deploy all this in your Azure cloud or on-prem or AWS or anywhere else on the planet? Is that one work item? 
Are we creating 50 work items because we need to deploy 50 virtual machines? You see, that's where it becomes a little bit ugly. That's where you need to talk to your DevOps lead again, I guess. I don't like the word Scrum Master, so I try to think about Scrum Lead. But if you don't use Scrum, then obviously there's no real message there. Now, the thing about the sprint is that the goal, you could say, or the aspiration or the hope, is that all the work is done in that two or three week window. But what if not? That's where you're going to move it to a backlog. So the nice thing about the backlog is that, first of all, you still got visibility on what needs to happen. And next to that, you're somehow feeling the pressure. And my demo here is pretty limited. But what it shows you here on the side is your sprint window from like a couple of weeks back. And you're going to assign number of hours for each and every work item, where I like the four hours. It's a morning or an afternoon. I think that's a perfect spot for a work item. Again, just my suggestion. You don't have to follow it. But the thing is that you're going to have so many like half a day tasks to work on, which means that, again, your DevOps team is now seeing a super long list. But it's a lot easier to move like half a day of work to, oh, I'll do that next week. Because this week I'm partying at Bellevue Conference, right? <laughs> See, that's where I lower my voice because it's getting recorded and nobody needs to know that you're partying all week. But then you're going to move it to a backlog, which means that we're not killing the task. It's still there. But it also doesn't mean that we're going to move it to the next sprint. So that's where you got that flexibility coming in. Well, now we can do the same. There's a lot more, but again, it's not about work items as such. We can shift to our GitHub environment. The leveling, the structure is a little bit different. For GitHub, it's still primarily, I would say, repository oriented, where you create a repo. That's Azure DevOps term. You create a repository, and you're going to have all the options. So there's a bit of code, what we call repos, right? You got issues, one point for GitHub, or an extra point because there's no issues in Azure DevOps. That's where we have the conversations in the work items. Actions is the pipelines, projects is the project, which now means that your GitHub project is linked to your repo. But what if you have multiple repos? That's where it becomes a little bit more challenging. But technically, you can do the exact same thing, and it's going to be pretty limited, what I'm showing you here. But I would say the core philosophy is the same. You have to do tasks. You're going to assign them to your team, and you're going to give them a status. I didn't tune tweak anything. This is just next, next, finish. Took me like a minute to build this. Well, now you could drag and drop them from one location to the other, and it's still going to move and update the status. But again, the look and feel is slightly different. But if you go like, well, I don't care about the look and feel. I just want to have my data in there. And we're making a big jump from an Excel file into like DevOps project methodology. Then I think it's still a fine product. Sounds good? That's where, but you skipped that part. We could do a first lap onboarding you to Azure DevOps. Now, the majority of you are using it. So what I prepped, and again, we can decide at some point in time, like, oh, enough talking. We want to do some hands-on. So I rely on you to tell me when you want to do that. So I have a, a first lap. I can show you some details if you want, where you could onboard a DevOps organization. If you already have one, you could create a project. You're going to import a GitHub repo with some sample code, some source um, application source code, and then going through some tasks. So let me know whenever you want. And if not today anymore, the labs will be available online. And I'll share the link. It's in the deck as well. Peter, I have a question. Yes. Is there a reason that the, the discussion on the, on the product backup items are not disabled, even when the work <coughs> item is in those states? Um, well, I don't know the technical reason why not. Oh, sorry. So the question is, I thought his voice was loud enough, but that might be in my direction. So the question was, why in Azure Boards, if an item is closed, that you can still continue the discussions, like the conversation thread? I don't know the technical reason behind it, but I can imagine that even if an item is closed, that it could still be a good option to keep the conversation going. Because you could always move from closed back to open. So it's like it's closed for now. And maybe, obviously, again, depending what you're doing with the project, you're like, well, we're going to awake the task again, or we're just going to create a new task. So depending a bit on how you're going to use it, I think it's still 
a, a good way to keep it. Mm -hmm. So with Azure DevOps, do you have a do you have a best practice or suggestion for how to lay out the orgs for a mono org and then for org per team or an org per project or your travel? Okay, so the question is about the, the structure, the hierarchy of your DevOps um, organization. So there is like the multi-org, there is the, the, I don't know, mono-org, single-org with multiple projects. Um, I think the easiest, and that's somewhere, but I could look up the docs, somewhere if you start onboarding to Azure DevOps, it tells you that preferably, but what does that mean, right? Preferably it's one single org and multiple projects. Because you're typically going to have, and it's a little bit against the DevOps culture, right? But you're going to have little teams working on a project. That project belongs to the larger organization. So you could say one organization would reflect a company. That's the preference. Now, if I would log on, and I'm not going to do it, but like even within the Microsoft world, I'm part of, I don't know, 30-something DevOps organizations. And I'm just a little part in the whole cycle. But then you could go like, well, but not all companies have the size of Microsoft. So I think, and, and if I look back at like how implemented um, Azure DevOps at customers, I typically try to stick with one organization. And then focusing a lot more on the project level, where you could have like, I don't know, a couple of thousands in, in a single organization. Yes. Um, with that idea, though, naturally, would if you're trying to separate uh, access and concerns between different teams, would it also be naturally easier to have separate orgs so that you don't have to section off those permissions at the project level? Uh, why? Well, yes. Yeah, because an organization is like a considered a security boundary, but you could do the same in your project level. Okay. It's just a little bit more admin work to create a project team. But well, you get a project team by design, and then you're going to move your users into it, which obviously means if you're going to split up like two projects in two organizations, yeah, that one part of the process is isolated on its own. But in the back, it's still using the same like Entra ID. I'm still trying to learn about Entra now. It's Azure AD for the last 12 years in the back of my mind. So Entra is still pretty new, but it's going to be based on the same user base. And you're probably going to link them to your Entra ID groups and then moving those groups into your um, projects. I can show you if you want how to, what that looks like. It's not that I have an extensive user base, but uh, boards, it's in the project settings, teams. So by design, when you create your project, so my project here is called eShop on Web. It's going to create an eShop on Web team, and then obviously you can create a customized one. And then the other part is that within each team, so the person who created the team, like in my case myself, right, um, is automatically a member. And then you would need to drill down on all the permissions that you get by design as well, which might be a little bit more tricky, again, across organizations. Good. Anyone who's not familiar with Git source control or got some questions on it and willing to admit? <laughs> You're all experts on Git? No. But using it, right? Anyone using anything else like no Git? Yes, there is something else, depending a bit on when you started with your source control onboarding. Uh, we had, what's it called? Team foundation version control, like the centralized option. Actually, not that long ago, uh, 20, well, seven, eight years, I guess. But no, I was thinking about a customer scenario where the customer, I was a consultant, and customer was using Team Foundation version control. And the downside was that you need to have direct connection to that. I don't know, it's not really a database, right? But like the, the centralized source control. And I was like, well, that's going to be hard because I'm traveling all the time. And I could only work for that customer on site. And one of the reasons was because half of the stuff that I needed to deploy in Azure was coming from that version control system. And you could not connect to it remote. Technically, yes, with a VPN, but they didn't trust me enough, I guess, to give me VPN access. Where now, I mean, Git is so much easier, right? Next to that, it's your fallback scenario. 
Because if you share your repo with 20 people and you all got a copy of that same repo, you got 20 copies. What's the strategy? You probably know all this since you're using it, but what's the strategy around like branching? Is that the hard question to ask? <laughs> Anyone like shooting everything into main? There's one, okay. You used to? Yeah. And the reason why? <laughs> well, if you got multiple requests coming in for like the same, same project, it, that makes things a hell of a lot easier, uh, harder to organize the different changes to say individual script projects. So that's why I was like, even if I'm like the sole developer, I got multiple requests, I would rather have those split in separate branches so there's separation of concerns for testing purposes. Okay. <laughs> So I like doing it because I can separate out your dev code and validate it before you push it up the main to get push out the production systems to keep them safe. Yeah. So you're running like a source control update, git commit, and then running like a build pipeline to validate, or is that like the next dream world? Yeah, that's like isn't that same as trunk based shooting everything in the main branch? Well, the trunk is typically like we're not directly moving to main but we're moving super, super quick into main. The feature branch is going to main at the end of every day or month. Yeah, where I would say that the branch concept, there's no deadlines, right? There's no pressure. You could keep a branch alive for as long as you want. It's not always recommended to do that, but it's, it's a little bit more stretched and it's flexible. And again, I'll, I'll show you one slide with a, how GitHub is actually recommending you to do it. But would you mind coming to the front and then you in the back as well? Why not the last for you? Yeah. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> he looks really scared now. He's like, what did I do? <laughs> so we're about three quarters in. I got a swag bag. And since the two of you are a little bit opposite in the mindset, like main branch and or, or like branching it out, Grab something out of the swag bag, <laughs> but not yes. my water bottle. Sure. That's mine. My fan standards are good for you. <laughs> Why is he here then? <laughs> <laughs> so if you participate in my questions and stuff, as long as there's stuff inside, you can only get one. We got more people in the room. Oh, you're getting picky now? Like, oh, I got a book, but I want to make sure I got the best book. No. I'll do that at the end. Thank you. Anyone still, anyone still reading books? I'm like cleaning my shelf, so. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, most probably. Can you give me a USB stick with an ebook version, please? I'll remember that for next year. Oh, by the way, anyone not having access to Azure in the way you want to? Like Peter has Azure passes? Yeah, if you want to play with it a bit or you don't want to use your production environment for testing, let me know. Because um, that's the other thing, right? When you want to do labs or offer labs to your learners, I need to make sure that all of you got Azure access. So if you want, I got the tools to do that. Then just approach me at the end and we'll make that happen. Or whenever you want to do labs, if you want to do labs. Cool. So version control or source control in Azure DevOps is Git-based. That's the recommended option. It's still not the default. So when you create a new project, you still need to identify what you want. Do you still want to go back to the version control from the past, or do you want to use Git? The cool thing is that once you start onboarding and using Git, everything you might already know from Git, using GitHub or any other Git command line. Anyone using Git command line primarily? Cool, right. some of you. I tried, I gave up pretty fast. <laughs> it's, it's too hard. And I think that the thing with like Git, it, I mean, I'm not breaking it down, definitely not. It's super intelligent, but it's also scary to use from the command line. And I think half of the comments, you probably never really need to use them anyway. Because what you're doing is like, I don't know, Git commit, and then every now and then when something goes wrong, you try to revert and okay, okay, that's cool, we can do that. But you can do all that in DevOps. I'm a very simple Git alias set for whenever I create a feature branch, it creates a remote feature branch by mm -hmm. And that just saves me maybe a couple of steps on the UI. Yeah. Anyone knows the oh shit git website? I'll show you. 
<laughs> so it's oshitgit.com, and there's also a, a, a nicer language version if you don't like the swear words in there. It's not mine, it's just something that I discovered years ago already. And it's where, in a somewhat funny way with interesting language, the person is explaining, like, in this kind of situation, like, oops, we messed up, right? This is how you can fix the problem. Pretty cool site, and I like the domain name as well, so. Good. So you're in your Azure DevOps organization. You create a project. You got the boards. You got the next part is now source control. Remember the DevOps cycle. We start with planning. Now we're moving to writing code. So it's Git as an option, but I would recommend you to use it. And everything you might know from Git, like the branching, the pull request, and everything, is available by default. If you extend it to Visual Studio, it's like a nice integration. If you use VS Code, it's the same nice integration. But that's the same for GitHub, so there's no real difference there. Then one thing you need to decide on, where do I store my code? Meaning, is it private, like company only, or is it public? I don't know any customer interesting enough using Azure DevOps for public repos. But technically, it's possible. I do know a lot of companies and users using GitHub for public repos. And then every now and then for private as well. Or obviously private end to end. So even there, the two products, I would say they're identical. It's again about the look and feel. But like in my case, I'm, if at least I'm writing code, I'm typically in VS Code or Visual Studio. If it's like really developing an app, it's Visual Studio still for me. But if it's Azure CLI, ARM templates, a little bit of PowerShell every now and then, then it's typically VS Code. So depending a bit on the use case, it's one or the other. But the integration, the interaction to your Git source control is identical. And again, any platform gives you the same options. Now the flow, and again, this is just one example, but the flow would be creating a branch. So you start creating your project, you go to repos, and by default, it's called the main branch. Used to be master every now and then, you still see that, but we tried to get rid of that, right? So it's now called the main branch. Step number one, when you allow yourself or someone else joining your code, is creating a branch. Never allow them to move to me, with the exception from the gentleman in the back, but that's fine. He got a book, so he's reading, he's happy now, cool. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as it works for your organization, then obviously nothing wrong with that. But how do you recover, by the way, when something is wrong? We have proper tests set up as in run whatever code through QA environments and stuff, and just create a fallback. So you're fixing it after. So you assume that your developers are doing a good job and always writing workable code? Uh, it's not a large department, so it's actually a do Yeah. One of the advantages, like the guy in front of us, of doing single. It's kind of trunk-based development in the way that, well, like you said, trunk-based normally is supposed to be short. You can merge once a day. But if you do it short enough to actually merge your code right away, you just do tiny, tiny changes, merge it, it goes to Q&A, make sure it works. It's, it's still like reverting the changes mm -hmm. a couple of lines of code for it. Yeah. Now, I will, I will talk about that, right? But to me, like Q&A means it's a running environment. But what if, like, I need to be careful because it's getting recorded and I'm not used to that, but take a step back, Peter. Re rethink about how you're going to rephrase this. Cool. <laughs> um, so what if, let's say, Friday afternoon, 4 o'clock, what we call beer o'clock in Belgium, and it works in Redmond as well at 4 p.m. on a Friday, but I'm like, I'm done with this. Closing my laptop, doing my last commit, but I didn't really check my local build anymore. Like, did it work or not? Fine, I'll figure it out on Monday. But then you're committing code, but then your build is failing, right? So when you talk about, oh, we'll push that through testing, but what if that test fails? Because in the end, if my build is not working as it should be, your test is gonna fail, you're not publishing a failing test into QA. I hope that you got like the release gates, quality gates set up to, to block that, right? So now what you could do with the branching and integrating a pull request and running a build through a pull request, that's where you don't have to move to Q&A. So it might be a little optimization. 
Google. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're not using just main all the time? Sorry? You're not using just push to main all the time? Not all the time. Uh, then I need to get my book back. <laughs> <laughs> so you would do a branch. And again, I would recommend anyone to um, tell your team, don't touch the main initially. Create a branch, and that's your playground. Every now and then I get questions like, but how do we tag a branch? Like, do we call it the Peter branch, the Sophie branch? I'm like, the whatever branch. As long as you know what's in there, that's fine. And then from the branch, you're going to run your commits. And I'm pretty sure you all know that like Git is a two-way step. You got the local commit on your local machine. And then from there, you're going to sync and publish to the remote call. And then hopefully, you got pull requests in place as well. Now, depending a bit on the platform, if you use branching, you got pull requests, but you need to understand a little bit more about pull requests. If you use Azure DevOps, it's not always telling you. If you use GitHub, it's always telling you. So that's, again, a little bit of a trade-off. What works, what not, or what part do you like? And then from there, eventually, you're going to deploy to preferably Q&A, right, or some other testing environment where I like to call releasing is moving into a running state. It's not published to production, because you're going to have a few iterations in between. And then eventually, when everything works, you're going to merge the code. And then depending on your decision, you're going to delete that branch that you started from. And you're going to create a new branch on the next start of your project. You had a question? Um, just thinking of a question. Um, where would forking play into this strategy approach? Um, well, forking is slightly different. So what you're doing with, well, forking is typically used in open source world, right? Anyone using it internal? I mean, you could do like inner sourcing, but anyone using forking for internal projects? No, still not typically. Yeah, I know it's, it's, not, it's no, an option, right? It's not really but, known too well in my particular team, but I did do it for a couple of open source projects. Which I'm curious. Mm -hmm. So the, let's see if I can. So we used it once when we had a configuration change. We wanted to set up some parallel services. And we had, say, one customer on one port and another customer on another port. So they were configuration changes. And we want to make sure that those stayed you know, live and active for a certain period of time. But then eventually, we would consolidate those services back to one and get rid of, kind of the configuration difference. Mm -hmm. But while that configuration difference was live, um, and being published, um, it would allow us to have the, the differences, but maintain you know kind of the link between the codes. Yep. Yep. Uh, I didn't even know there was Copilot in the whiteboard in the meantime as well. So the the previous one. So you start with a branch. You got a commit message, and then eventually it moves into main. I'm shortening it a little bit. So you would do this like continuously, and then in between, so commit back to main, updates commit back to main, where a commit could be like going all the time. Now in between, you're going to add your pull request, where the pull request, and I still sometimes am confused about the naming. You're not really pulling anything, you're pushing. But you need to look at it from the main perspective, right? It's like pulling in, accepting if you want your changes. The other nice thing with a pull request is that it's not forcing you to accept it. So you're the developer or the DevOps engineer, you're here. You commit your changes, they go in through a pull request, and then it's like waiting, nothing's happening. Because this pull request is not a required feature. Obviously, in a full like organization-wide scenario, why would you not use it, right? But again, there's no, no reason for not accepting a pull request, but it's also not a requirement. It's also why I like using um, a, a super, what I call a super granular branch, or what some call a feature branch. Like if you need to work on, I don't know, um, it's springtime, what could we use? Two weeks ago, I used like Easter weekend and an Easter banner on the website as an example. But now there's like not too much happening. 
What's that new clothes? But yeah, but tonight that's gone. Oh, perfect example. Why were too late for that, no? no? Oh, no, not yet. Cool. Okay, let's use, do we need, really need to use the Eclipse as an example? This is getting recorded. They go like, oh, Peter's using the Eclipse. Oh, how silly. So no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Whatever example, where you're going to move that into a pull request and nobody's accepting it. Where obviously if you would create a, a feature branch, let's do the Eclipse. Why not? Sorry for the folks on the recording. The Eclipse example came from the audience. <laughs> so you would create a feature branch like a, I don't know, publish a little Eclipse marketing banner on our website um, on, I don't know, April 8th. Where obviously you're going to move that into commit, you're going to move it into a pull request and somebody's going to accept it. You merge in main and it's gone. And then you could decide like, well, what the day after? Because showing an Eclipse, interesting. Showing an Eclipse banner tomorrow doesn't make any sense anymore. So that's why you would think about like, oh, we're going to use a little toggle and we're going to turn it on or off. Does that go back to the, the feature branch? Yes or no? That's details. We're now the, the forking. Let's see if I can move this. The forking is slightly different because what you're doing with forking is starting from main, but you're creating a full new copy of that where it's not 100% linked anymore to the original main one. There's still that link, right? Because from here, you could again do an update. Well, the pull request would be here somewhere. So step one, you would fork. Come on, help me a bit. You would fork that, but that means that now it's a separate copy. Well, now if we use the same approach as before, we have our DevOps engineer. We now have the local copy. I'm now working against this forking. And then at some point, it might go back to the main. So it's, it's two different paths, I would say. Yes? I feel like when you do something like that, would that not introduce a potential for high like, merge conflicts? Typically, yeah. It's also why, and not breaking down open source models, but it's also why if you look at a lot of the open source offerings on like GitHub, but that's details, there's a lot of pull requests that never get merged. Where for me, it's like, well, why am I contributing to your open source project if you never even look into my pull request suggestions? So I think, I would say technically, it feels to me that something's wrong with the model. But on the other side, I mean, there's so many great examples where forking is like the perfect example. Like even within our Microsoft world, like out of the uh, Microsoft Learn, my division, so all labs that we have are open sourced. And the st first step is creating a fork. So in, in my PE tender, my Microsoft account, GitHub, there's a forking of the Azure 400 content. And I can play with that fork. But I cannot go directly into main because there's like 17, well, probably 170 steps in between validating before it actually gets accepted. But I can do a whole bunch of stuff on my fork. So it's, I would translate it as moving the responsibility out. Because I control my fork and I could invite other ones to help me updating my fork and maybe not even ever going back to the main one. So the concept is slightly, slightly different. Cool. You want to see a demo on branching, how it works in Azure DevOps? Yeah, I thought you already used this, no? So who's lying like 20 minutes ago? Good. Going to close this. Uh, zip. So step one, you would go into your Azure DevOps project. You go to repos. This is, by the way, the example that I shared on GitHub that you can use, and you would clone it. So you would copy this out. Uh, submit. So it's now cloning, so grabbing the main from Azure DevOps backend into 
in my local machine shouldn't take too long. Oh yeah, it's conference Wi-Fi, that's why. And then from here, I'm just gonna do something silly, right? Update the code. I'm gonna save it and then this little source control magic should kick in. Well, now I could do PDT demo one and committing the changes. Now again, when I commit, it's a commit into my local copy on my local machine. So now the backend, Azure DevOps, still doesn't know about it. Well, now if I push sync, that's where it's obviously synchronizing, two-way. So it's, if somebody else is making an update in main or there's a commit from a branch and updated main, then I'm gonna download it as well. By the way, that little in-between sync changes, that's a safety net. Because you could have a whole bunch of local commits and then maybe once an hour, or why not at the end of your work item, like right before lunch break, right? That's where you're gonna sync to um, the DevOps backend. And again, just a suggestion, you don't have to follow it. If you don't like that in-between step, like, oh my God, I assumed that I was synchronizing it automatically, you can go into the VS Code settings and then it's gonna sync automatically. But by design, it's like a two-way step. Well, now from here, if I go back, I go into my commits. You can see that the PDT demo is there. And the nice thing is that all the history from all my other attempts last couple of days to build my content for the workshop and just updating labs, not creating content. Um, updating my labs, everything is still visible. So over here, I had my initial commit and then you start updating some stuff Then I played with some merging and you got that full history. And again, that's also a nice thing about the Git source control, that whenever you import a project from like maybe even seven years ago, that full history would still be there. And if you don't like that, you could do uh, what's it called, Git squash, and then it's cleaning up, but only if you're using branching. The other nice thing is if you use branching, uh, that you could also get rid of that historical messages. And there's sometimes a few funny ones, like I'm working on an internal project no, I actually started a project three years ago, still working on it for our trainer team, where they're using a web frontend, three clicks, and it deploys a demo environment. It's all Azure DevOps, a REST API based. And every now and then I get frustrated because I'm like committing changes every few minutes. And it's frustrating because sometimes it's because of YAML, and you already know I don't like YAML, right? Where it's like, oh, there's indentation is wrong. And it's like, oh, pipeline map, too bad, I'm not running. Then you have to go back and make a change, and then you have to go back and make a change. And that's like my DevOps day. <laughs> Luckily, it's only one week a month, but still it's sometimes frustrating. And every now and then you see that in the commit messages as well. So every now and then you need to explain to your manager, like, what does this mean? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, there's this commit message that says, Peter's done with this. And I'm like, yeah, that was the nice one. Look three commits further. <laughs> But that's in short how it works, cool. Now I could do the same demo, like going back to code and then updating it, going to Visual Studio, updating it, that's all details. What's more important, I got a slide on that, but that's details, is how can we protect our branches? That's what we call branch policies. Anyone not using branch policies? No reason to it, or you just don't know? Okay, cool, finally gonna learn something in a, one hour in the session. But you already got a book, so I want good positive feedback. <laughs> What's the reason for handing out swag, right? It's just for getting good evaluations. But then I needed to bring 36 items. Bag wasn't big enough. Oh, but I got Azure passes. So you actually all got something to take home. Cool. Um, branch policies. So you go into your branch. Oh, let's create a branch. Let's, let's do this first. Uh, VS Code, cool. You click on the main branch, you create a new branch. We're gonna call this the PDT Live 1009. Do, 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 do. So now down here, let me know if I need to zoom in for the ones in the back. I'm in my PDT Live branch, which now means if I'm gonna remove this, that's from my colleague, and this is Peter's new code. Saving it, refreshing, you don't have to, that's fine. And then PDT branch updated. 
commit sync. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. Then over here, I got my new branch coming in, PDT Live. It's updated and it's one version ahead of me. This is easy because it's just me, right? I mean, if we got the main branch, we got the PDT. I could make this a lot more ugly, but I'm not gonna do that. By the way, it still shows you the um, version differences. So if I would go into, uh, what did I update? My readme and then history. You get the view of the commits and then, whoops, compare. It's gonna show you, you removed some stuff, you added some stuff. I could do the same demo in GitHub and it's gonna give you about the same experience. It just, the view looks a little bit different, but the, the core concept is the same. But now I made my update, Peter's new code, but it's still only in that Peter branch. So now the next step is I wanna bring this into the main branch. I could merge this, that's totally fine. And to do that, we need that pull request. That's what I meant before, like depending a bit on the tooling, it's gonna be there or it's not gonna be there automatically. The nice thing about the, and again, this is just Git, right? It's not Azure DevOps or GitHub, it's just Git concepts. If you do a pull request, it's reusing the commit message, which might be okay, but every now and then, depending what you write in your commit message, it might look a little bit weird. Don't ask me how I know. You could integrate a, re a reviewer. So you could allocate a team or individuals where they need to approve it. Linking it to work items. If you like it, if you don't like it, that's up to you. And then you're gonna create a pull request and then somebody needs to accept it. Peter, yes? The, the part that you just showed, linking with the work item, does that work backwards with what you showed on the PBI itself, where you have the option to link to your repository or branch? Yes, yes. But up till now, it's all, I would say, optional. It's voluntary if you wanna use it, yes or no. But I'll show you how to enforce this using the branch policies. So let me first merge this. And then there's one little thing that I think is a bit ugly. If I do delete the PDT branch here, I'm gonna complete it. I'm gonna close it. So now my pull requests, they're gone because I cleaned it up. My branch history is still there, but now my PDT branch is gone. Unfortunately, over here, it's still there. So I don't know that my backend did a merge because I do not read all my notifications. Yes, you do get them, but who reads those emails, right? Yeah, local, right? Yeah. yeah, but look what happens. So if I do, because I didn't know that somebody accepted my pull request. So I'm gonna do more updates. I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna commit. Oh, no, Peter, you need to provide a message. New updates, whoops. Yeah, yeah, I know, that's fine. New updates. And now I'm gonna sync, and it's like, man, too bad. I don't like this. <laughs> I, I think what it does, I, I mean, we don't do it proactively, honestly, but we have a, we had like 200 branches in our infrastructure repository, which were never cleaned up. Mm -hmm. This would help um, avoid that behavior, where you have a, a, like a whole slew of branches. Of course, you might want to keep your branch locally for some reason. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think it's a good feature to remove it from remote and not tamper on your local branch. Yeah, but how do you move on from here? You, re, you what, refresh it? I think also might, uh, the, that answer might change based on whether you're doing a merge and fast forward versus mm -hmm. updates or squashing. But it's a bit ugly, no. I mean, it would be so nice. <laughs> hey, Mr. Git, if you're watching the recording. <laughs> okay. So if you have automatic syncs or not where it does, it does pulls, it should clear up your local repository. Yep. Yep. So the solution indeed is like enabling your automatic sync in the two ways, and then it's gonna fix it before you're even writing updates. Yep or like some do not using branches, and then that's avoiding the problem at all. <laughs> uh, good. So let's do the same. I'm just gonna protect my main, but it's the same in, in any branch you have. So you can go into the options, branch policies, 
And you got a whole bunch of these. So the default ones, I would say, is require reviewers, so somebody needs to approve it, where it would be like two as the default, but could be five, could be, I don't know, whatever number. The interesting part is that here you're not um, specifying who needs to approve it. It's just like my PR needs two approvals from whoever. Then linking to the work item is what I typically enforce as well. Because if you think back about the DevOps concept and the planning phase, right, it means that you're not allowed to work on anything if there's no work item. That's the biggest pushback to your <laughs> DevOps PM. Like, oh, you want me to work on something? Create a work item and I'll fix it. But I'm not gonna create it. And then every now and then, depending how powerful that person is in pushing back, you still need to create your own work item. That's bypassing the problem a little bit, but anyway. Well, now you're not doing anything. You're not allowed to update code or do anything you want if it's not getting linked to a work item. So your branch updates will never work. Your pull requests will never work as long as there's no work item attached to it. So those are, I would say, my two recommendations. Reviewing, somebody reading through code, and then doing the work item integration because it goes back to your DevOps planning phase. But then you could make this a lot more fancy where you could interact with build validation. If you have code coming in, like whatever language or I don't know, .NET example, doesn't matter, you're gonna now run a build cycle before you're gonna merge it. So if the build is failing, you're never even allowing it because you know that it's never gonna run fine anyway. So now you could enforce that if you have required, obviously, and, and a whole bunch of other options. So I would say when you use branching, my first step would be enabling policies. The downside is it's a little bit harder because if I'm giving my team, oh, I closed my code. If I give my team the flexibility to create, come on, do do do. View, command, palette, git, branch. Updates, commit, sync. So now my new PDT branch will be there. But that means that now somebody needs to watch over and control the branch policies for the new branch that I just created. So it could come with some additional overhead where I know situations from customers where again the DevOps lead, you could say, is pre-creating the branches linking them to policies and then telling the individual teams like, well, you're supposed to work in this, I don't know, Eclipse marketing banner branch for the next couple of hours. Instead of giving the, the flexibility, the freedom to your DevOps team to create their own branches. But in the end, I mean, the outcome would be the same, right? It's just that if you allowed your team to create the branches themselves, it might be more challenging to link them to policies. Because by the time your DevOps lead figures out like, oh my God, there's a new branch from Peter, but maybe by that time it's already gone again. So you need to find the scenario that works best for your setup. Yes? What are the most common kinds of policies you see organizations enforcing on like feature branches that your non-main branches? Um, Just to give like kind of a reason behind that question, like I, from my experience, most often I see your main branch being where your policies are enforced, because that's your, your protected source code. Mm -hmm. Your branches are that's doing their thing, and then it's Yeah, the, so I would say definitely, so the, the reviewing the approvals, um, the work item integration for any, any branch, um, and then definitely more policies to protect main, because that's ultimately what you want. You want to protect your main branch. And then the other ones, it really depends. Like the code validation, I think is a good one to have. That whenever you commit a change, it's gonna run a build pipeline and validating code. Even if you go as a developer, you go like, well, I tested it on my machine, my build is successful, but who knows what else is gonna happen in the backend. Or maybe it might run fine on your local machine. Like code-wise, it's all fine. But what if, I don't know, I'm publishing, um, 
let's see, what kind of example? Oh, like, I don't know, .NET 4.8 framework, which requires Windows, right, as a platform. When I went to build pipeline, you define, oh, I'm running this against Linux for whatever reason, because, oh, my company is standardized on Linux, right? Then the build is gonna fail, but not because of the code being wrong. So that might still be good to validate, like, oh, code is coming in, we're gonna run a build pipeline, and then validating if it's working or not. Yes? I have a question about the build validation. Um, you know, we have these uh, pipelines that do the deploy, and that's build and deploy. Would doing build validation be me just pretty much duplicating the exact build steps and saying, hey, just prove that it builds, and that's all? Yes. Yeah, because you're linking it to your build pipeline. You're not writing another pipeline to oh, do that. I would link it to say do the build. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it passes, oh. you'd want to put conditions on certain steps and stages so that you're not doing the deployments out to the right, stage. right. Yeah, just the build. Just the build. So right. we added code linking to our pre pre PR approval step. So if the code doesn't match the format, then it doesn't. The PR doesn't get approved. Mm -hmm. that, that that happens before build and deploy. Now, I got a section actually right after this one on the build and deploy build release pipelines. Because you could combine them, you could have multi stages with validations, and I'll, I'll show you all that. Cool. Yep. Just a little while ago, you kind of mentioned something about the YAML pipelines and how it's kind of tough to let them miss the index or something when it failed and you go back. Is there any better way of like testing the YAML files locally or anything? Or is it always just kind of crafting where you like. You edit the ammo and then set it out to the build, just see if it's going to work, and then it's just yeah. custom stuff. In VS Code, there's the right click format. You could do the format. For formatting, yes. But I mean, oh, aside from like the formatting, if you just don't I, have like your stuff. Copilot. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I, also know, I also know that if you're uh, editing the pipeline file in the like web editor, there is a validate option in the top right corner. Oh, so okay. don't fire errors if. And I'm using some templates that actually connect to a second repository for uh, shared tools. So I'll be able to tell where errors are in the other repository. Uh, yeah, I'm using the, I think it's Red Hat YAML or something. Yeah, this one. Okay. That's just going to cover basics. Yeah. It's not going to cover anything if you're, um, yeah, my attack right now is using a shared tools repository and then having projects with build pipelines linked to that for a shared template builds. Mm -hmm. Cool. So many options there, right? I mean, but I like this one because it helps me at least the indentation, which I still think is the biggest frustration in any YAML syntax. That's the one I use typically. Um, apart from that, I don't know. Um, never looked into a, like a, a linter or something like we did with PowerShell, right? Yes? So, kind of a question about pipelines and the YAML and stuff here. So, I've done extensive use with like Jenkins pipelines in the past, and Jenkins have the ability where you can write a pipeline uh, either in the declarative format or Groovy, and then you could send that uh, file to the API and say, hey, is this a valid pipeline? And it would spit you back, like, oh yeah, this is a valid syntax, or it would give error and say, no, this isn't a valid syntax. Um, does that support exist for Azure DevOps pipelines where you can write a YAML, send it to Azure DevOps service and say, hey, is this a valid YAML file? Before I go and actually try and just pull request one, merge, fix the pipeline, open up the um, Fix the pipeline now. That would be cool. That would be yeah, kind yeah, of it's important. Yeah, it, so you have to validate button that someone mentioned in Azure DevOps. You can take that and make the pipeline. That does an API code in the back end. Um, if you're curious, I have a module that does it for you. So, so yeah, it's fully supported. You just send the entire YAML template. Uh, you have to define which pipeline ID you're trying to try, uh, try it out against because it does some validation like for templating and stuff as well. But it, it works and supported. Cool. Yeah, so if you search for like Azure DevOps REST APIs, then you might find it. I don't know about it, to be honest, but it looks like it exists, so that's cool. I don't remember which API code it is. You have it to go in and edit the pipeline somewhere, you have a pipeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically just press F12 and look what it does. You can do the same thing. Yeah, you just go to the pipeline on the left side, open your yeah, open the uh, file, maybe just click on one. Yeah, edit pipeline. 
and then uh, the three dots button next to run. Sorry, then. Cool. So if you do a bit of. But I only know that being available there. Uh, network. It might not work because we do have some policies in place where, oh, it looks like it's work. Typically when I do my network option open here, then half of the time it's all of a sudden like, oh, you're not connected to the network anymore. It's a, it's a Microsoft machine policy. But this one looks like it's working. So based on this, you should be able to connect to this. I cannot highlight it, but that little balloon that comes up. So API contribution hierarchy query. That's apparently the REST API call for this validation. What's that? Hierarchy query is a backend service in Azure DevOps that does sort of large scale. But yeah, but if you then look into the response and then you're gonna find out the details, right? Cool. Uh, good. So this is GitHub flow. Same thing as before, but that was the Azure DevOps recommended approach, like the branching and pull requesting and everything. And GitHub has about the same, so they gave it a term a couple of years ago. They call it GitHub Flow, which is like probably what, I don't know, 95% of the GitHub users are following because it's what they offer by default, which means you're gonna create a branch, you're gonna make changes, you look it up, uh, hook it up to a pull request, you add some new commits, and from there you're gonna merge it. So basically about the same flow as before. You don't have to use this, but again, I know 95% of the customers using GitHub are just sticking with the default. I'm pretty sure it's also why that Azure DevOps story is so close, because it's, again, it's a Git influenced, but inspired a bit by GitHub as well. But everything we talked about before is still valid, and then this was the placeholder for the branch policies. By the way, in GitHub, I need to remember that every now and then I need to show you. Chris, oh, Chris is gone, okay. So if you want to learn more about GitHub, then it's the afternoon session from Chris. He's going to do a GitHub Actions deep dive, I guess. Um, so from here, uh, you go into your repos. That's the starting point. And then in settings, you have the branch uh, policies somewhere. Branches and then branch protection rule, where technically most of the settings are identical. So you can require pull requests, you can do the um, approval, you can do the validation, but no link to the project. Like the work item integration, they don't seem to have it. But apart from that, technically doing the same thing. Good. And then there's the blending of the two worlds. So you use Azure Boards, the fancy tool, the complete tool, whatever name you want to give it, and your repo is in GitHub. Yes, that works. Totally fine. Because one is a project management tool, the other is where your source code lives, right? So there is an update, and it actually is still in preview again. So there was an update, like, I don't know, two, three years ago already where now there's a new updated preview where they provide more features. So if you wanna play with this, I can only show you one thing. Everything else is um, like getting rebuilt, you could say, well, the plane is already flying, but that works fine. So what you need to have is an integration. You go into Azure DevOps, you build an integration to GitHub, so you just authenticate or you provide a token, and you do the same on the GitHub side, where you're gonna integrate like a GitHub application called Azure Boards, and that's gonna bring those two worlds together. You can define if you want that integration on the full organization or specific uh, projects or on the GitHub site, which repos you wanna use this feature for. And I'll show you how to do that. So from within your DevOps project, that's where the boards lives, right? You go into GitHub connections. Mine is already established, but you just do new connection, connect to GitHub, Continue, you authenticate, magically works, because I'm on a Microsoft device, it's not really magic, but it's validating a lot. And then it's gonna offer you a list of um, which projects, uh, no, which repos on the GitHub site do you wanna use this feature for? And then you click save, save, next, and that's pretty much it. 
Then on the GitHub side, you go into your um, organizational level, you could say, go into, I need to remember, settings, applications, Azure boards. Then you need to authenticate, haha. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Do, 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 do. Unlock, come on. So from here you go into the settings and you define for which repos you want to enable the Azure Boards integration. In the docs, it doesn't tell you that you need to do the same on the Azure DevOps side. So that's why I'm showing you the, the two ends because you need authentication on the two ends. Now the outcome of this, if I go into my uh, repo, my retail, And I'm going to write some code updates. I commit my change. By the way, I don't think it's a good thing to do edits directly from within the portal, but that's details, right? So what you can do here is adding a B hashtag with the number of the work item. So I got, I think, 739 if I remember work item 739. So you can do AB hashtag 739 space, and then everything else is just a traditional commit. So this is gone. Source code updates, pull requests, that's all on the GitHub side. Where now if I open up my work item, it's now having this deep link as they call it. And now I got from here, if you look at little balloon here, it's uh, directly going to that commit message on the GitHub site. That's a pretty cool feature. So think back about if you are using Azure DevOps today and everything used to be Azure DevOps only, but now you're feeling that rush or the interest or the Microsoft GitHub salesperson telling you to migrate, right? I'm not in sales, so I can say that. To move to GitHub, you go like, yeah, but wait a minute. We got Azure boards, we got that link to work items in Azure DevOps. So what about that feature? That's the big reason why they have this. So you're not losing the PM functionality and you're gonna keep your teams happy because now they can use GitHub source control. Will those links break though? If you have links in your, on your boards to your Azure Git repos and let's say you might link to GitHub, those links would break, right? Yes, yes. But that's part of any migration, right? Yeah. Looks like somebody needs a break. Shall we do a break? I have no idea if there was any official timing for break. They just said like whenever they ask or oh, you need a break, I don't need breaks. I just keep going. Yeah, it's 10.30. Perfect. What do you think so far? Happy? You're taking a break and not coming back? Or... <laughs> cool, good to know. Then I'll uh, keep doing the same. So the next part is pipelines. Then we have a bit on migration best practices from one platform to the other, and then closing with security. And anything else you wanna talk about. So pipelines, out of what you told me and based on some questions, I think you're all familiar with pipelines one way or the other. Some do like classic, some hate it in the meantime. Some like Azure YAML more than GitHub YAML, but in the end it's YAML and it's frustrating. Where there was only one gentleman in the back who actually loved it. Still don't know how that's possible, but interesting to learn more. So what is a pipeline? It's where you're gonna stack everything that you already have together. Think about you have your development team writing code. They, I don't know, assumably gonna test it on their local machine. They move it into source control. You're gonna run a pipeline to build it to test it, to validate it. And then later on, we're gonna inject some other features into it. We talked about the source control, pull requests, branch policies, and then if you want, integrating code validation, which means running a build pipeline. There's a big part about 
should we have built and released together? Like building something and at the same time we're going to publish it, moving it into a running state somewhere. There's good and bad, I would say, in that opinion, where there might be good use cases to have them separate. Depending how you're going to run your runtime testing. If you just want to validate code, I think a build pipeline is more than good enough. But what if you want to run a validation that the code, or not only the code is fine, but you also want to see it running. Like an easy example, you write a, um, I don't know, code for a web app, you're going to publish it to Azure, and you want to make sure that it is actually working fine. So what you could do there is creating a build pipeline to validate code, publishing it to your Azure, I don't know, Q&A test environment, and then once it's done, you're going to allow it to move to production. Make sense? Anyone having a favorite build and release together, build, release separate, or it depends? We are yeah. moving from the classic release pipeline to YAML based build and deploy. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's where the build and the, the deploy both all is in one YAML. And I believe that's also called multi stage pipeline. Yes. Yeah. My understanding was that is the recommended approach from Microsoft going forward. And that's also kind of an industry approach. Having, uh, those, having the pipeline configurations in YAML and having the same pipeline code that deploys to multiple. So build once, deploy multiple times. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I, I don't know enough to say can we inject a testing step in between the build and the deploy stage right now. Uh, yes. So you can, and I'll, I'll walk you through some sample code, and I think most of them are actually on uh, our public. Well, not the ones in DevOps, but I could share them if you want. Um, so the, well, the thing is, obviously, there is, I would say, that best practice, right, where you would do build and deploy together, or build and release in like the classic terminology. But to me, it all depends on what you want to get out of that. Because if you think about, like going back to the starting point, we have our sprints, we have our two weeks, apparently, uh, for a lot of you, like, oh, we're going to commit code, we're going to run a pipeline, and we're going to deploy it. But maybe you have a lot more builds coming in where you don't always want to deploy it. Again, it's not like move to production, right? Hopefully you still have some stages in between. So that's where um, you could spread it out. You could have like a build pipeline and then hooking it up into a release pipeline or a deploy as we now call it. So you got a few options there. The other thing, and that's a little segue to topic number four, like why not spreading the environments? So thinking about a little bit on history, and then someone was using Jenkins, where I remember in the early days of Azure DevOps, and even in the early days of the Azure DevOps trainings, we had a lab that actually would do build in Jenkins and release using Azure DevOps. Where now I'm somewhat seeing the motion, like, oh, we're gonna keep build in Azure DevOps, and we're gonna deploy using GitHub Actions, or the other way around. And again, it's just using the two platforms depending on the structure of the team and whatnot. But the baseline remains the same, that you need to build a pipeline. And it all depends on the details, like anything else, right? If you're going to glue those two stages together, or if you're going to separate them. Another challenge that comes in is, how can we validate? What if my build is fine, I'm going to deploy, and it's not working? Like half of my pipelines, um, out of that scenario that I talked about with the trainer tool, half of those pipelines are failing. It's not because of the pipelines, it's because of Azure. Does it mean that Azure is wrong? Not really, it's because our trainer subscriptions are locked down, because it's a free internal Microsoft subscription, which means if something or some region needs more priority, then our subscriptions are moved all the way to the back. Because obviously we wanna make sure that a customer can deploy their workloads. But if a trainer cannot do a demo, well, too bad. So I could have a successful build but I could have a failing uh, deployment because I'm publishing to central US as a region and I'm running out of quota. Or I'm publishing to east US and I don't have permissions to do that because somebody within our Microsoft stack defined that I'm in west US and I should never deploy something in east US or any other scenario. And that's where I think you have some benefits in splitting up the different stages. And then the other part is also validation, what we call quality gates. And I'll show you how you could integrate that as well. 
Now the baseline for a pipeline, and again, I know most of you are probably familiar with this. So you start with a trigger. It means push the button or rely on automation. Like if there's code coming in, we got a pull request, like the whole Git scenario we talked about, and that's gonna be the trigger, what we call continuous integration, the CI part in CI CD pipelines, right? Then you're gonna run a pipeline with at least one stage. Within the stage, you have an agent, that's the VM running the job. You got the job, and underneath the job, you got a task and steps. Terminology is not at all important. Only if you start using the two platforms, you're gonna see that the logic is the same, but the terminology is quite confusing. So you start with one stage, and then yes, you have the multi-stage, and I'll show you an example. And if you want, but probably not anymore today, you can do a lab on that as well. Where I got a pipeline with five stages, four different languages, one is .NET, one is Node. You're gonna run the build, you're gonna move it to a test environment, and then eventually adding some other stuff. Give me a second. So from there, you're gonna build up your steps and tasks where each task is a little something individual, like publish an Azure Web App, run an ARM template, or Bicep, or Terraform, or whatever choice you want. That's up to you. So the good thing, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of you at some point moved that step from, I have my collection of PowerShell scripts, like Azure CLI or Azure PowerShell, I have them on my local machine, and then step one into DevOps was I'm gonna move all my scripts from my local machine into source control. And then the next step is, instead of me running five steps in five different PowerShell scripts, I'm now gonna glue all of those together. And that's a pipeline. So the step in from I'm doing everything manual into I want the pipeline to do this becomes pretty straightforward. Because you don't need to change anything. The scripts you already have can most probably just be reused. That's how I moved over one weekend, seven, eight years ago, from, oh, these are all the scripts that I have. I'm gonna move them into a pipeline and then adding some validation into it. And half of it is actually still valid today. And then there's that question about the agents. I try to combine two platforms in one slide, looks a bit ugly, but MS means Azure DevOps, GH obviously means GitHub. Where we have the Microsoft self-hosted, that's where you take control, you define the layout, the look and feel of the machine, or you're gonna use the Microsoft hosted ones. I don't think we have enough time to discuss which is better. I like the Microsoft hosted because it means that you don't have to worry about the VMs, you don't have to maintain them, but it also comes with some limitations. The good thing is that they are self-destructing. At the end of a pipeline run, successful or failed, it's blowing up itself. To make sure that obviously like not anything gets left behind. But if you have like a pipeline run every five minutes where you wanna run the pipeline across different stages but the source code is not really changing, your pipeline run takes like at least, I don't know, five times longer because you're, every time you run that pipeline it's gonna copy the code into that VM. Well, now you could move to self-hosted. You can run it wherever you want. Typically, you're gonna run it in Azure, I guess, but it could be on-prem. You just go into Azure DevOps, you download an agent, and you're gonna run it. It's firewall friendly, that's typically the other question. It's just outgoing HTTPS to Azure DevOps, but that's a big cloud service. So typically, your firewall admins don't always like that. They go like, oh, isn't there like one public IP? No, there's like, I don't know, 75 or something and every quarter they're changing. So if they're running in Azure, you can point to an Azure DevOps service endpoint, and that's a little bit easier to manage. Then that's again running in Azure, where maybe your cloud team don't, re or your security teams don't always like that. So there's always, again, good and bad. The funny thing is that on the GitHub site, as I already mentioned, it's the exact same thing. And in the meantime, the VMs are technically also the exact same VMs. So that newest update from like April 4th I'm pretty sure, hopefully, I don't know, but didn't check on the details, but I hope that in the next coming days or weeks, we're gonna have the same Azure private networking in Azure DevOps agents as well. There wouldn't be a reason for not having it because again, it's the same virtual machines. And then obviously supporting Linux, Windows, and Mac, where there's details about the versions. It's important, you can find all the details online. Um, what is coming with each VM out of the box. 
Because you might think about, um, like in my case, if I deploy an outdated .NET application, that default Microsoft hosted build agent doesn't have that framework anymore. Which means that now all of a sudden you have to extend your pipeline. Because you need to tell the pipeline or you need to tell the agent through the pipeline, like, hey, I want you to install this piece of software. And then the other thing with the self-hosted, like are you using VM images? Are you using, I'm gonna install my operating system and out of my pipeline, I'm gonna add all those tasks or I'm gonna start from a fresh image and my pipeline is super slick. So all those questions, all those concerns, you could say it's just adding complexity. Yes? Uh, so the question is if there, if there is a predefined um, image for Windows 11, um, not that I know of. You could create a self-hosted one, so you build your own Windows 11 machine, but I don't think out of the Microsoft hosted or the GitHub runners, I don't think we have clients over there. I could check on that, but you probably know where to find it. And then the shift from classic Azure DevOps, we're still in Azure DevOps, from classic to YAML. So again, there's nothing wrong with classic. I think it's still one of the big strengths, or at least it used to be the big strengths of Azure DevOps, where it was drag and drop, pretty graphical, not all too hard, and at some point even pretty aligned with Visual Studio look and feel. So a lot easier for um, onboarding, you could say. Well, now the, the default behavior is no classic anymore. I talked about that little feature flag you can enable, or the feature toggle you can enable to still go back to classic. So the way forward is YAML, where again, YAML is sometimes not always that easy. The syntax is hard, sometimes finding like which tasks reflect classic mapping to YAML, it's not all that easy. Does classic have that branch association if you're making a major change in a branch and you need to the pipeline? Bless you. Classic doesn't allow that change to occur only in that branch, correct? Uh, no, correct, yeah. Well, you could define some filtering, right? Like based on the trigger and then the classic pipeline options, that it's not looking into everything. But yeah, a little bit ugly, I would say. So I'm gonna skip some slides and then showing you some stuff. Uh, I'll show you our internal project, but it's my project, so I guess it's fine. Where actually only the last month we shifted from classic into YAML. I'm not gonna bore you with building a classic pipeline, I'll show some parts of it. But the magic to migrate is going in to your tasks and then you find this little button that says view YAML. So you open this up and then it's gonna give you a little snippet of code that should allow you to copy paste into YAML and ta-da, we're done. That's where the should be is important. I migrated, I don't know, 30 something pipelines, not a lot. And it was not that just copy pasting easy. Why not? Because all of a sudden, depending on um, a lot of details, a lot of the information is now getting taken over. Connected service name, I have no idea what that stands for. If I copy paste this into YAML, it goes like, well, I have no idea what that means. So why are you giving me that option here? So you need to leave that out. Then it's only showing you the steps. But what about all the other parts? What about my trigger? Oh, we don't have that view YAML button to show you the trigger built up. So it's, I mean, it's not bad. It's, it's definitely helping. But then also the way Classic is picking up some variables is every now and then different from how YAML is picking it up. So short message, half of my pipelines, I had to rebuild from scratch. So what do I do? And I'm so sorry, but I'm gonna do it anyway because it's what I use every single day. I know some of you don't like Copilot and that's fine. You'll get there at some point to like it. <laughs> Write me a DevOps pipeline to validate.NET application code and publish to Azure Web Apps. I 
I didn't say I needed YAML, so the assumption is that Copilot thinks it's YAML, which I think is fair. <laughs> it's providing a whole bunch of explanation that I didn't ask for, but that's fine because I'm learning. And then it's producing me pretty okay YAML code. <coughs> and pretty okay, I mean, honestly, it's about 95% accurate. Every now and then it's doing interesting co-pilot-y things where it's coming up with tasks that do not exist. Like a, out of that migration, so I was using an external third-party plugin for sending emails, where now I decided to move it to PowerShell scripts and using Logic Apps just to try something new. So I was like, well, hey, Copilot, can you help me writing the Logic App task? And it produced me like seven, eight lines of code that looks quite okay. And I didn't look into any details, so copy pasting, moving into my pipeline, running it, and Azure DevOps like, what's this? Azure Logic App published task? I don't know what that is. So I went back to Copilot, and I was like, well, can you point me to the documentation? And then it came back like, well, I cannot find documentation on this. And I was like, well, maybe because that task does not exist. And then it came back and it pushed me into Azure Functions. I'm like, well, okay, but that's not what I asked for. <laughs> so that's a, the thing about, I would say, Copilot. The nice thing that I like about the term is that it is an assistant. It's a tool, you're in the driver's seat, you keep control. So don't just trust anything that comes out of it. Don't copy paste without knowing what it's doing. That's my recommendation. But on the other side, it literally helped me migrating my pipelines in a faster way. And again, if you don't like it, too bad. It's not going away. <laughs> but I think it's, it's pretty nice. Even how to make money out on YouTube. But that was a question from an AI co-pilot session I did at a, a conference a few weeks ago where they were asking, I was asking for some examples. Somebody said like, oh, can you post a question? Like how to make money on YouTube? I'm like, yeah, fair enough, why not? So hopefully that person is now making money on YouTube. Good. Um, the other scenario is where, come on, you have different stages in Classic where you got this little thing in the middle. Anyone knows what this is? Approval. Approvals. What's the other option there? What's that? The gate, quality gates, yes. You can come to the front, use the swag bag. So what we have, and I think it was one of the big strengths of Azure DevOps in Classic is quality gates. So how does it work for the ones who don't know? Before and after every stage cycle, technically the options are the same. You could integrate quality gates. This is the almost out of the book out of the box behavior. So it allows you to validate Azure policy. If you're not familiar with Azure policy, it's where the Azure backend, the fabric, validates, are you allowed to deploy this, yes or no? Like my example I shared, I have a pipeline publishing to East US, the pipeline validates, okay, East US looks like a viable Azure option, but for whatever reason, I'm blocked to publish to East US. That would be an Azure policy. But now from the pipeline perspective and the pipeline run, it's like, oh, you got this web app, the build code is fine, I'm gonna publish. And then it's like the annoying Azure policy, like, oh, too bad, Peter, you're not allowed to do this. Which means my release is failing. So that's where now you could validate. Or you could use an Azure function, since you all like PowerShell, you probably know functions. Yes, you can run all PowerShell scripts, schedule tasks in a function today, and then running a validation. Sending, I don't know, uh, a validation to some web app that you published. Validate HTTP 200, are you coming back? Yes, 400, oh too bad, my pipeline fails. Something like that. Or you're not even publishing to production because again, your website is not working as it should be. If it's not Azure or even with Azure, you could use REST APIs. If you don't like functions but you still wanna trigger a REST API call to whatever, whoever, whatever, then you could still run a REST API as part of your publishing validation or integrating with Azure Monitor. So you publish something to a live running website, where now it's like, oh, wait a minute, that website is down, which means that all of a sudden your publish won't work either because the Azure backend is not responding. Like if you do a zip deploy package, 
um, publishing task. And the web app is not responding because it stopped or the region is down, then again, your pipeline's gonna fail. So you can help yourself integrating all those validations. And the work item is going back to, are you allowed to publish this task to publish this new piece of software or anything else? Oh no, Peter, you cannot do that because you still got 50 bucks to work on. Going back to the PM part. Anyone knows how to do this in YAML? Environment. Yes. So there's a little hidden, and I'll show you. There's a little hidden, why well, it's not really hidden. It's hard to find, and it's misusing Azure DevOps environments, where environments was never built to be a quality gate. It's just a feature that we had years ago to define, like, I want to publish to virtual machines or Kubernetes or nothing. And it's the nothing that we now reusing for quality gates and YAML pipelines. Because the YAML syntax, even in GitHub, has no understanding about quality gates. So you need to find something else to wrap it around. Which now means if this would be 100% YAML based and, and script task based, you don't have to use these classic or the environment interface. You could just run a task, run a curl command on Azure CLI or something, or on the, the virtual machine agent at least, run a curl command and do a REST API call. That would be totally fine. But you need to build it, where now it's just a little bit, I don't know, easier to integrate. And then Sonar Cloud, I'll talk about that at the end. It's a security validation. Scan my code for security vulnerabilities, and based on the outcome from the security tool, we're going to give you green light or not to run the release. So moving this into YAML, Uh, just going to grab one of these. You go into environments, create new environment. I already have one. And oh, they moved it. You have about the same options here. The one missing is Azure policy. Don't ask me why, I don't know. <laughs> That's the one we're missing. The other um, options like the scheduling, what we here call business hours, that would be your schedule trigger from Classic. So the wording is a bit mixed up and, and some other features are missing as well. But most of them are quite identical. Well, now you just define all your checks. So I could go in and I could specify like, well, I want you to run this Azure function or I want to integrate my branch control if it's not out of the policy from before, and so on and so on, the approvals. But since YAML does not have syntax for that, the only thing you need to add on top of your pipeline, somewhere on top of your pipeline, is the keyword environment and pointing to the environment name that you defined here. That's it. You can do the, about the same on the GitHub side. The approvals is there. The quality gates are always a little bit harder. But again, the concept, because it's DevOps, right? It's, it's also available. You can only do that in a task. Yes. Are there other tasks? <laughs> yeah. It's the one that I'm using most, that's right. But I would say, so again, sharing some best practices, right? Um, even in small setups, even in a pretty straightforward scenario, I would always recommend you to look into the quality gates. In classic, if you're still using it, and then moving it into YAML. Then the multi-stage scenario that we talked about before, don't worry that it's failed. Oh, it's over here. Oh, it's a green one. So what I'm doing here, oh, I'll first show you the outcome. This was one of the other labs you could go through. So what I'm doing here is running standalone um, stages. So the infra stages deploy Azure stuff. Where I'm using Bicep, and yes, this could be ARM templates, this could be CLI, this could be Terraform, or any other flavor that you like. It takes about three minutes and a half to deploy functions, Key Vault, Cosmos DB, like a whole bunch of Azure resources. Next to that, some of the application parts are running based on functions, some of them .NET, some of them Node. 
Now, if I know that my Azure deployment takes three minutes and a half, and I know that my .NET build and my build node takes about a minute, I'm gonna glue those together. That's what we call parallel jobs, which by the way, comes with a cost. You need to enable it, and we're gonna charge you for that, because you're using more um, agent compute. Once all three are done, we're gonna integrate validation. Only if all three stages are successful, we're gonna deploy code. Because this means that now my Azure backend is live, and once my Azure backend is live, we're gonna publish the .NET and Node functions. Then we're gonna add some other stuff. In this case, it's a event grid, and eventually deployment successful. I was sending a PowerShell-based email. To do this in code, Uh, sure. So you're, you're deploying code using that pipeline, right? Some other, some other kind of code. Mm -hmm. And the first of those three multi or parallel tasks was Terraform. So if you make code change, but not an infra change, uh, I'm assuming you're auto applying those changes as well. So how does how does that work with Terraform? Does it alert you that there's no infrastructure change? Well, that's the I would say the, the infrastructure as code concept that everything that's already deployed and not changed will not be touched. So I, I deploy it the first time and it's like, oh, you want me to deploy an Azure function, a Cosmos database and whatever. If it's not there, I'm gonna deploy it to an Azure resource group. But then later on, it's gonna validate and it's like, oh, the Azure resources are already there so I don't need to change them. So does it notify you I would think that you would need to review it before you blindly trust it. Uh, yes. So what's the confusing part there? It does notify you that, hey, we are, I'm running, rerunning this pipeline and there's no new infrastructure being provisioned, just as an FII and it runs by itself. Yeah, it's just gonna, it's still gonna run that stage, but it's not gonna apply any changes. Unless out of my code change, I made an update in my bi or in this case it's a bicep, but that's that's just one of the options. So as long as my bicep code is not changing, let's say I publish a function using a consumption plan, but then all of a sudden I decide to move to to like a, a premium plan, I'm going to make that change in the bicep file or ARM template or Terraform, and that's going to trigger a change. So it's going to run the new build, and then it might pick up the old version of my source code because I didn't change my source code. So it's gonna see that there is still the same version of the artifact, because that was my latest successful build run, and nothing's gonna change. I'm, I'm trying to relate it to the way we do our Terraform code inside Azure DevOps. We, we have an approval step where you go back and look at the plan before they say, yes, this looks good, this is doing what we want it to do, and then we apply those changes. Mm -hmm. You're not doing that. You know. No. Well, not in this case, at least. Yeah. I was going to comment on you just talk about approval gating between the Terraform like plan and the rollout. Or, so. Yeah. Which would just be three different tasks in your stage, right? Okay. So you do the Terraform init plan apply, and you would just wait for the feedback from each stage, or task run. Cool. Uh, good. Then the other thing that's every now and then. Confusing. Oh, by the way, this interesting here. I talked about migrating from classic to YAML. So what we did in DevOps is giving you all the um, classic task look and feel experience and allowing you to complete it from here. So if I wanna do Azure app publish, this is the exact same little view from classic. You complete all the settings and it moves it into a YAML task instead of copy pasting. And it's actually sometimes quite useful. The other challenge with um, multi-staging is reusing variables. And if you already know, I'm sorry, but I know that a lot of you don't know, so I'm still gonna talk about it. So what you, one example here, make it a little bit bigger. So what I'm running here is a little PowerShell task that's creating a random name. Just one of the so many options, there might be different ways to do this, right? where now I'm linking this to a variable name called random name, and then I'm creating a new variable 
that I call like gen random from generated random name. I'm gonna pass this on to the next task. Zip. As long as you're within the same stage, you don't have to change anything. So any variable or even parameters um, that you define within a stage, they're recognized within the same stage location. But in a multi-stage scenario, you need to define like, hey, variable from task one in stage one, I need you in another stage. So what you need to do there, and it's not 100% defined in this one, but what you would do here is adding a field called name that's gonna add a name to the task. It's not the same as a display name. So if I would call this name, I don't know, like a random something something, if I move to a different stage, like what we did here, there's a stage infra where I'm running my bicep deployment. I'll show you again that task. It's called deploy bicep, that's the name of that bicep deployment task. And now I'm gonna tell in my next stage, like hey, I want you to pick up this variable called upload image web app name, and it's coming from the infra in the previous stage. So you're gonna build up your leveling, you could say, and it's not 100% well documented. Sounds good? This is one of the, I would say, the biggest challenges or the biggest reasons in my multi-commits, <laughs> like 37, I think, is my record, where I'm or missing the indentation, obviously that's a typical one, or I'm missing my um, name in my task where I wanna reuse my variables. And then the other thing, I'm not sure if I can show you in this example, but there is a difference over here if you define the variable and you could also add the is output equals true. Anyone knows the difference between those two? Like after this variable name, you add is output equals true. That, that makes it available for the other jobs or stages within your pipeline. Yep. Now the confusing part is that if you add the is output equals true, then the way you're gonna point to those variables is now becoming different. It be <clears throat> sorry. It becomes interesting when you move from a single stage with multiple tasks, and all of a sudden you're just gonna add a new task, or a new stage and a new task, and all of a sudden your variable is like, whoop, mm, too bad. I don't know what you're asking me. So that's why you need to look into um, some of those details. When would you use, what, what is stage versus a task? Can I use, do you have to use a stage for every deployment uh, environment or can they be different tasks? Like dev is one task, QA is another one, production is task and C. I would do that in a different stage because then you can use the um, depends on, uh, where do I have it? I think okay. I might. The stage dependency, yeah, that's for the variables, right? But then up here, so that depends on, so I'm running my deploy code, but only if my infra is successful and my .NET compile and node compile is successful. Where if you do this within the same task, it would be a little bit more challenging. So those stages have to be defined before the one that's actually calling them. Yeah, because in the end, I mean, you could do this in, in like different tasks where you could say like task one publish to Azure Web App Q&A or test then publish to Azure Web App Q&A, publish to Azure, I don't know, staging or whatever name you want to give it and eventually production. But then the dependencies, the definition will be harder. So I like that like multi-stage to just run that kind of like validation. And then the environment, so that's what you see up here. So this one little keyword environment and demo is the name of my environment uh, definition. That's where now before it kicks off this job, it's gonna run through the quality gate validation. Like if I have that REST API validation, it's gonna check like, oh, Azure Web App, are you there? And if not, I'm, I'm still not gonna run. So bringing, like gluing everything together, you could say, that's the, um, the main scenario here. Then the other part, and I'm skipping a whole bunch of slides, but I guess that's fine, is this Azure subscription thing. 
I think I have it somewhere in the deck and you'll get access to the deck, I assume, at some point, where you need to specify what we call a service connection. Now it relies on a few different options, a service principle, managed identity, or something new that's called workload identity. How familiar are you with all those things? Or you want me to go through? I don't know. Workload. workload identity? No, that's still. We are moving to workload, but if you could go through, then that would be great. It might still be in preview. I would need to check. I think it released now, right? Yeah. 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 Ye
I think that's pretty much it. Cool. So what it gives you is four parameters. The app ID, that's the app registration, the display name, a password, and a tenant. Next to that, you need to find your subscription ID. So you go into your Azure portal, you search for subscriptions, and you find that ID over here. Now from here, again, whether you have the permissions, you're gonna run this command, or your security team or your identity or identity security team, whatever name they have, they're gonna run this for you. Now if you do this on your own, you go into new service, Azure manual, because automatic is not working, and you copy paste that information. By the way, going back, that is not Azure DevOps specific. If I go into Terraform, because it doesn't always need to be bicep, right? Uh, at some point in time, I started using the same for my Terraform deployments. Uh, Terraform. I just don't remember which one it is, but I'll have it somewhere over here. So you could create a Terraform TFRs, like a centralized variable file, where you would specify your credentials. These are partly the same ones from your service principle. Or even embedded in your deployment, and again, I don't remember which one I used for this, but uh, oh, over here, but that's the same thing. But I had the same, and these ones don't exist anymore. I had the same like inside one single Terraform file, which now means if you're spinning up your Terraform deployment, it would use the service principle permissions. Now, why am I so comfortable in showing you all this with service principles and whatnot? Because luckily our Azure team figured out that the default from like two years ago was not the best practice. So what happened until two years ago when you created a service principle, it would have contributor permissions. And that means a lot, because it means that you can do whatever you want in that subscription, but not changing permissions, because you need to be owner for that. Well, now I created my service principle, but it's not having any permissions in Azure. So you need to go back, and I don't know the comment by heart to do that, but it's adding the scope. We are gonna define like, hey, service principle, you get permissions in Azure, role-based access to do this. So the scenario could be that out of your pipeline, let's say you have a deploy pipeline to create your initial infrastructure. You're gonna point it to a resource group because you're not creating the resource group out of your infra deployment. You could now create a specific service connection that only has contributor on that specific resource group. And then in the next stage in your pipeline, you're gonna to point to the application, what's it called, application deployment, I think, RBAC permission where you're publishing, like impersonating a developer publishing code to a web app. But now you can lock down that specific service principle, like all oh, the only permission you get is publish web app code into that specific web app, but no else. It's a little bit of additional admin, but that's what security folks like. Make sense? Good. Now the challenge is that in whatever motion you create a service principle, you create some sort of a service account. Like years ago in the on-prem world, you deployed SQL Exchange, SharePoint, and all the other stuff, you would create a service account. It's still the same concept, but now we call it a service principle. But then within Azure, you have something called managed identity. Concept is the same. The good thing is it's creating an app registration that we call a service principle, but it's not sharing credentials. So the way forward, I would say, within Azure, so one service in Azure connecting to another, the recommendation is use managed identity. Now Azure DevOps understands managed identity, but only for the agent. So it means that when you wanna use managed identities to publish something to Azure, you're forced to use a self-hosted agent. So you cannot link a managed identity to the Microsoft hosted agents or the GitHub runners. 
it's work in progress. It's somewhere on the roadmap. So bless you. So I could go back, new service connection, Azure, and then managed identity, where now I need to deploy a virtual machine in Azure and preferably a virtual machine pool. I'm gonna turn that virtual machine into a managed identity, and that's my security model. Where now my virtual machine is running some sort of a Azure admin impersonation, and it allows me to run my pipelines to at least deploy something into Azure, right? Which was okay, but again, not all customers are using that managed identity because they don't wanna deal with managing their own servers. And that's where now, since I think somewhere beginning this year, the end of last year, we have workload identity. So what is workload identity? It's where you're gonna use the OpenID OAuth authentication concept. So Entra ID or, I don't know, Google identity and so many other cloud identity providers, they're all based on OAuth and OpenID. So what you're doing with workload identity is, and it's still a little bit too fault, you create an app registration or service principle, right? In your Devo, uh, sorry, in your Azure environment, but then now preferably you're gonna do that using a managed identity. Where next out of that managed identity, you're gonna link it to your Azure DevOps. So you need to create a second identity for Azure DevOps as being a cloud application. We're now out of the pipeline. Each and every pipeline run is reaching out to Azure. Hey, can I please get a token? Because that's what OAuth and OpenID are doing. Me being Azure DevOps, your trusted application in your Entra ID, can you please hand out a token? So instead of managing credentials, it's now getting like the bare minimum permission level to ask for a token. And everything else is still valid, like the managed identity, you still got RBAC, you're still gonna lock it down, but you don't store your credentials in Azure DevOps anymore. So it's the managed identity concept from Azure to Azure resource communication that's now available in Azure DevOps as well. And we have the same on the GitHub side. Questions? All good? Still happy to learn new stuff? Cool. Uh, let's see what else. Because now I jumped from my pipelines into some security stuff. Uh, okay, I think that's fine. Talking about how to do this on the GitHub side. So we have pipelines, which in GitHub are called actions. You need to store them inside GitHub slash workflows. If they're not in there as YAML file, they're not considered an action pipeline. By the way, this GitHub for Azure is a public repo with a few examples on how to publish a .NET app into Azure in a couple of different ways. So one example is using service principle. So I got my stage, can I make this a bit bigger? I got my stage, a job, so I told you terminology is about the same but slightly different. So I got my job, got my build, got my steps where this is the build piece, like running some .NET magic and then running the deployment. Where at some point here, it's now asking for credentials. This is just a secret inside GitHub. So what I did with Azure DevOps, that nice looking graphical interface for the credentials is technically the same thing on the GitHub side. You create a GitHub secret variable called Azure credentials and that's that JSON output do I still have it over here? That little JSON output of four, including the, the, I don't know, mustaches is what one of my colleagues calls them. And you're gonna copy paste that. Or you can make it a bit more granular and you go into, gonna make it a bit smaller again. Go into settings, security for actions. And you're gonna split it up. So I got a whole bunch of these. So I got one Azure underscore credentials. That's by the way, the hard coded name you need to use. Or you can split it up where you're gonna use client ID, subscription ID, tenant ID, and the secret. So it's all in one, one little JSON copy paste, or you're gonna split it up. But technically the outcome is the same, right? Uh, zip. So I got a few examples here 
and then the GitHub OIDC, that's where we're using some sort of the managed identity, what we now call workload identities in Azure DevOps, where it's your GitHub environment getting a managed identity in Azure, like, oh, you're now a trusted application in my identity, and whenever you run the pipeline, you hand over the bare minimum, and I'm gonna allow you in, or not if you don't have RBAC set up, that's the thing. So the best practice would be moving, indeed, to workload identities on the DevOps side, or using this OIDC login where it's the pipeline run, but technically it's the runner asking for authentication. Yes? Um, I don't know if it's relevant or even possible with workload identities, but I know with uh, service connections, you can share a service connection between projects. What are the pros and cons to doing that, and how would that affect security with, say, the workload identity set up? Uh, from the DevOps side, it's still a service connection. Even like the API calls and stuff, it's not changed. Yeah. Good. Let's see, I'm gonna flip back to my slides to make sure I'm not losing. Yeah, sure. So in our environment, we're the current state is we're using YAML for our, our CI, our builds. We're using classic release pipelines for CD deployments and link them together. Um, and it's been a little while since I've done a little bit of testing with, um, with using multi-stage pipelines to, to maybe you know, reproduce the same functionality we have in our classic releases. Um, and there's, I know even according to the roadmap, there's some things that are working on that to try to ease that um, transition, things like manual stage triggers um, that you can't quite do in multi-stages yet. But one thing that comes to mind is, um, if I recall with environments, um, and I think it even said it when you were showing your demo environment, that it was automatically created when you diff when you say the name of an environment in your multi-stage mm -hmm. channel. If it doesn't exist, it'll create that environment. Right? Yep. Um, and then you can, of course, define um, quality gates and rules on that environment. Um, my question is, is if, as a DevOps admin, I want to define, say, a, a set of quality gates or approvals on a quote-unquote production environment, environment within Azure DevOps. Um, with classic releases, I know that if uh, a, somebody else, a developer or somebody else who's allowed to create a release pipeline mm -hmm. uh, for some new product or something, um, in classic releases, we create a stage for production. They might not be have the permissions to actually select our a production service connection. Yeah. Follow me. So um, we create a service connection. There's, I believe, access control on each service. Mm -hmm. Only certain people can actually select to use it. Whereas in a multi-stage, if you have a production environment um, that you allow people to use. Is there anything to prevent somebody from specifying Changing it. rod for your environment and then a task within that deploy that says use this service connection? Um, what's to prevent them from just plopping a prod service connection in there and specifying something to deploy to prod even though they don't have actual access to that service connection? The GUI kind of prevented it with release classic cla releases. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, well, there's a few parts there. So first, in your environments, you have the security model for the environment. So who can make changes in like the, the schedule and, and all the other options within? So that's one. Where next to that, on your service connection, you have again the security model. Where then next on the pipeline, you also have the security model. So if you go into pipelines, uh, manage security, you can again specify like a whole bunch and in our environment it's pretty open, but you can link those three together. So you could have a service connection 
somebody's creating it because at least somebody still needs to define it in any of the three motions, right? Service connection, typical, or the um, managed identity for the VMs or the new workload identity. Somebody still needs to define it. And then on that one, you're gonna define permissions. Because by design, and again, it's getting recorded, so I need to be careful. <laughs> but there is one baseline security model that when you create a new connection for any of the options, that's fine. In classic, everything worked. All service connections had access to all classic release pipelines. But now for YAML, you need to identify this, grant access permission to all pipelines. Technically, it means to all YAML pipelines, but the assumption is that pipelines is YAML and release is classic, right? Now, the downside is that once you flag this here, you get access to everything in YAML. So that's where in, I would say, in a production corporate environment, you would now go into your pipeline and you would use that security option as well. So you would almost create like a security group that's linked to the service connection, whatever of the three models, and then defining like, oh, you're the Thole boot in my example here, you're the Thole boot pipeline, so I'm gonna create a Thole boot service connection, and I'm gonna give you permissions to run it. But you cannot run whatever other pipeline we have. And it's again locking down your uh, security model. Yeah, so that's the thing. If you don't flag it and you run the pipeline, where inside the pipeline code you point like, hey, I want to pick up this service connection name, it's going to ask you for approval and then it's going to give you that one single permission for that one single pipeline. Yes? So, you know, like enterprise, there's the ability to have a dot orders file within the repo that kind of defines people that can make critical changes to the repo so that the pipeline. Does that concept exist for the YAML pipeline for the PDO? Because I think the concern here as well is, you know, since the developer along the similar lines of what they presented is, if I want to release this to production, I'll just, you know, or I don't want this to go through this gate, I don't want this to go through this check, I just want to, you know, modify the pipeline, check it in, get, get to, to reviews and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's again where that security model comes in and I think it's quite complex, but that typically means it's quite good as well. So the security model, without going into a lot of details, is touching on all different Azure DevOps levels. So it starts with organization, then security on a project, and for each level there's like 30, up to, I don't know, 35 different security settings you can enable or, or reuse the default ones. But you have that on org, you have that on a project, you have that on the repos, you have that on the pipelines, and then eventually on the pipeline, individual pipeline itself as well. That's um, those approvals and checks, they are actually way more useful than just for environments. You can actually apply them to your service connection. Mm -hmm. so that way for the force of you, not, not just using security, but also the Like, um, well, one example that maybe I could still talk about is like, how do we migrate from one environment to another? Where I got one scenario, I'm just gonna show you, don't need slides for that, where, so out of, like again, this project, right, where everything was running in a release and then we wanted to shift to YAML, but then the front end, the web application that we have in front of it, that's using REST APIs to kick off a pipeline, the API to call a classic pipeline is different than a YAML pipeline. And we didn't have enough time, like Peter working on this, didn't have enough time to rebuild that full application and repointing all the APIs. So what I did was creating an in-between step that I called classic pipeline to YAML. So what I'm doing there is running a little bash task. And I got this in a lab, I think. And if you want, I can share the code. I didn't build this, I mean, I built, but I didn't come up with the code myself, but technically what you're doing is running the pipeline ID, so that's the 101 is the number of the YAML pipeline, 
Then you're going to run a connection to, and that's where it's a little bit ugly, connect to team foundation something something. So that's like the built-in URL to connect to Azure DevOps, connect to APIs, pipelines, and then read out the 101 pipeline ID. Then I'm going to reuse my deployment variables, and then I'm going to trigger the pipeline using a curl REST API call. And then sharing the credentials. So out of the, the web app front end, they're connecting to classic release, and then the classic release is kicking off the YAML pipeline just using this pretty basic bash command. It's nothing more than a curl request. And then added some validation because the downside, I'll, I'll show you the web app. It's not open sourced. I'm waiting for approval to do that. But there's a bit more in creating an app that your own team is using within Microsoft or sharing it with the rest of the world. Because then all of a sudden, like Microsoft legal team needs to flag everything that you're not sharing code and not sharing credentials and all that stuff. But it's a work in progress. But from here, I could pick a scenario, deploy it, pick a region, and technically four clicks, and it's running my deployment. So this is a tool that we published for our internal trainer team. Where in the back end, depending on the training we're doing, it's creating a full end-to-end -end demo scenario or multiple ones. Now, the front end is just .NET Blazor, and the back end is Azure DevOps. Now, the front end was always connecting. Now, it's updated since uh, two weekends, where the old version was using the classic APIs, which means now if I'm moving everything to YAML, the tool is not working anymore. So I had to rebuild quite a lot, and that's where that in-between motion from connect to classic and then read out and kick off YAML was working fine. The downside, what I'm doing here, is connecting to the status from each and every deployment. So again, using different API calls to read out each and every stage and job within the pipeline. Well, now if I look into my classic that's spinning up the YAML, the only thing is like, okay, I handed it over to YAML and my job is done. So instead of giving the trainers like, the view on this is where in the pipeline it's, it's, um, it's running. It was always like, oh, cool, my deployment took five seconds. But that's just like I need to wake up a YAML pipeline. So that's where that in between is OK, but it's not 100% solid. But then, so how did I end up here? Because for this pipeline to run, connecting classic to YAML, you also need to specify permissions. Where this project collection, build service, it's like a built-in team, needs to have the view release pipeline. And this build service needs to have some other permission. My screen looks a bit weird. But that's back to that permission model, where for each pipeline, for each uh, classic or YAML, and then the project, and then the org, it's interesting, challenging. That's how I would call it. Cool, let's see where we are. So we talked about Azure DevOps, a little bit classic, how to move to YAML and then a bit on the YAML side, the multi-stages. Got a, a exercise on that with the one with the five or six different stages, if you wanna go through, <coughs> through that one. Then a bit on the GitHub action, so again, it's Pipelines Engine. It's YAML, but it's different YAML, so that's the interesting piece of it. But the concepts are exactly the same. That's all what we talked about. We're then thinking about, and some of the questions already answered this, right? Where everyone in DevOps talks about CI, CD pipelines, where the assumption, if you don't know all the details, is that you're gonna run your build together with release or what we now call deployment. But that's not always the case. You might have a whole bunch of CIs and then maybe once a week, once a month, once every three months, running one single release or deploy. And that's back to like, how do we build our single stage, multi-stage, what are the dependencies? So in the examples I shared, we're running everything in one. Why? Because the mindset of the, the pipelines in our case is that we do our training, we use the demos. When the training is done, we delete our Azure subscription resource groups. And next week, Monday, when we need those demos again, we're gonna deploy them again. 
So we always need infrastructure, we always need some code validation, and we need the actual deployments, which might be totally different in your case. So that's where, again, you got that flexibility. Next to that, we talked about uh, approvals, talked about quality gates, starting with, I would say, source code. Think about the branch policies, that's where you would use most of these. And then gradually stretching it to your um, build and deploy validation in classic and again in YAML and then doing the same on the GitHub side. The other part is security. I hope I still have enough time to talk a bit about security. The nice thing is that you have your pipelines and you're just gonna integrate security influence tasks. But one example out of the so many, one example I'll show you is GitHub security for Azure DevOps, which I think is an interesting fact that it literally means that we're bringing those two worlds closer to each other. I mainly the whole talk about my story this morning. Showed you the quality gaze, showed you multi-stage, so that's fine. Talked about service principles. So the traditional service principle, managed identities, the new workload identity, that's all done. You can play with all this at home if you want, cool. Then a bit on migration. So these are just two or three slides, so nothing too fancy, but one of the questions obviously that comes up is like, okay, now we have the two worlds. Some of you this morning admitted like, well, we're using a little bit of both. How do we move from one to the other? Yes, the story is how do we move from Azure DevOps to GitHub? I don't know any customers moving from or starting with GitHub and moving to Azure DevOps. It's not that they're not there, it's just that I don't know them. So what is one approach? I would say, first of all, if you have repos in Azure DevOps and you want to move away from it, move everything into GitHub. It's all Git based. So what you would do is um, go into your Azure DevOps repo, Git clone, copy it to your local machine, and then do another Git clone from your machine, or not a Git clone, a Git push from your machine into the um, GitHub world. The full history is there. So all the commit messages and everything else that you want to keep is there. Or you do that git squash and then it's like, oh, fresh project in GitHub and we don't have the history. But at least the source code is still there. So that would work. Preferably, I would say, but again, it's just my take on it, is keep Azure boards, knowing that we have that integration with the AB hashtag pointing to the work items from within GitHub. I think it's totally okay to move the repo because you're not really using functionality, but you're not really adding anything new. But then at least it's already one part in GitHub. And then keeping Azure boards, unless, again, GitHub projects is good enough. Then migrate classic to YAML. I think it's just overall recommendation, start doing this now. It's not too hard, I told you, it's always depending a bit on how complex the releases are to move into YAML, but at least the code snippets are there in a lot of different views. And worst case, you got Copilot to start over. And that works pretty good, actually. Then moving or that's another option, moving your classic, keep them running and move them into GitHub Actions. But that means starting from scratch, building them again. And then maybe running a classic pipeline in Azure DevOps out of a GitHub Action. Anyone ever tried that? Why would you do that? I know, because it's a cool demo. <laughs> no, there's a use case, right, where you might have, and that's, I think, typically what happens in an organization is that you got some teams starting with Azure DevOps years ago, maybe moved from TFS into Azure DevOps. And then you got like some newer teams are typically the younger ones in the company. And they go like, oh, I learned GitHub in college, so I'm gonna use GitHub, right? And then one project is running in DevOps, the other project is running in GitHub. We're now out of triggering your Azure DevOps pipelines using that REST API call that I showed you as one option. Or you could now point to, um, Azure DevOps pipelines from within GitHub. And if you think about the philosophy behind it, it's just like, well, we are in this migration mode where from today on, we're gonna build new things in GitHub, but what about the old stuff? And you could gradually move from one to the other, even if it's only getting a view on which pipelines are running. So it's not like, oh, Peter told us that now we need to rebuild a little pointer in actions and keep everything running in DevOps for the next five years, that would not be a good migration strategy. But like an in-between time frame, I think it could help some organizations. And then the artifacts, we didn't really touch on it, but that's your package backend, right? <coughs> so 
where you would move them from ADO into packages on the GitHub side. Same thing, same languages. I mean, that's all pretty straightforward. So this is that snippet that I showed you how to move from classic to YAML. So you can read through and then if you want to ask questions, I showed you migrating repos, pretty easy. So you go into your DevOps repos, clone, you copy that URL, you go into GitHub, and then you can create a new repo. I'm the owner, this is the PDT Live 1208. Oh my God, 20 more minutes. Then you create it, and then from here, if you're fast enough, you remember like, oh yeah, that's right. I don't need to do anything on GitHub, I'm just gonna import code. So you're gonna import, and you copy that little URL from here into here, and then import. And then it's gonna ask you for a login and a private access token, and that's misleading. Because here you think like, oh my God, now I need to go back to my security team because I need to have a personal access token from DevOps, which technically any typical DevOps engineer does not have permissions to create. Now this is misleading because what you need is Git credentials. So it's not an Azure DevOps token. You can just use these Git credentials. So I could copy this over. And now me being the DevOps engineer, I can migrate this on my own. A lot easier than reaching out, hey security team, can you please create me an Azure DevOps personal access token with read permissions? And you go like, well, it's read, who cares? But they probably still care. I mean, actually they should. <laughs> so it's gonna take you, I don't know, some time, the two week sprint, right? <laughs> to give you that token. But from there, everything should be moved over it's not the longest one, not the biggest one. I'm not gonna wait for it, you'll see it. It's, it's working and all the Git history and everything is in there. Then migrating from YAML to YAML. Again, it's YAML, but it's not the same YAML. So the structure will be different, the staging job leveling will be different. And that's again where I showed you Copilot could be a good help instrument. Write me this code. Or, hey, this is what I have in my Azure DevOps YAML. Can you translate it or transform it into a GitHub pipeline? And it's gonna do a pretty okay job. And again, remember, validate. Don't just copy, paste, and run. Make sure you know what, uh, what's happening. Or worst case, rebuilding. So this is details about the structure, some examples, where the other nice thing is that the default shell is also different. So if you're using the Azure pipelines by default, it's using the command CMD, where now the shell in GitHub is PowerShell, which I'm sure you all love, but every now and then, all of, some of your comments are not working anymore. Because now PowerShell is expecting some other syntax. And that's where every now and then you need to go back like, hey, why is this not working anymore? The same with like <coughs> reading out variables, um, like the echoing and stuff, depending a bit on the platform could be different and these are just some examples from um, the documentation. I already showed you the co-pilot, so I'm not gonna do that again. And then this one is how to trigger your Azure pipelines, classic or YAML from within a GitHub action. Again, it's not super fancy. Oh no, we found an error. Well, that's lame. <laughs> sure. And it's not even telling me What's the problem? That's fine. I'm pretty sure it worked because it worked last night. Uh, oh, the GitHub one. If you wanna use it, I got a sample public, it's called ADO pipeline run. Inside my actions workflow, I'm using this, so I create a token, a personal access token on the DevOps side, store that in GitHub as a, a secured secret variable. 
And then I'm pointing to my DevOps world, I'm pointing to my project, and I'm pointing to the name of my repo. That's pretty much it. And then the look and feel, it's been a while since I ran this, but maybe we can still see some of that. Because now my personal access token is not the same one anymore. Two months ago, that's not too bad. There's not too much to see here. It's just telling you like, okay, I triggered it and that's pretty much it. But again, if your team is moving into GitHub and they wanna get that one single view or the project management is already linked in GitHub, you can start managing a lot of your DevOps way of working from GitHub and still keeping the old stuff in life as well. Good. I think we're gonna make it. Last part is security integration. Again, got some slides, so I'm gonna move on, make sure I can wrap it up. So the scenario here is that typically, you see security happening all the way at the end. So out of the concept, again, not about the tool, it's what we call in the industry shifting left, which means that instead of waiting for your ops team to validate security, like oh, we spin up a web app in Azure or anywhere else, or containers or VMs or anything not important, we're gonna rely on the network security, like the firewalling, the DDoS attacks and stuff. The mindset is now bring security into not only the front, but into every cycle of your DevOps motion. Which means, and you can see a lot of options here, threat modeling, that's back to the planning phase. You're gonna think about security, like what are we running? Where are we running it? Who needs to get access to it? That's why you're gonna define in threat modeling. There's a free tool out of Microsoft that looks like it's a tool from the 90s, but it's actually still getting updated. It's called threat, Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool, and it interacts with a public GitHub repo to give you like pretty up-to-date Azure layouts. Like landing zones, anyone familiar with Azure landing zones? So some of those templates are now moved into threat modeling as well. Where the baseline out of threat modeling is highlighting, like, oh, you're building this kind of architecture in Azure, and it's gonna highlight all the security risks before you're gonna deploy it. That's obviously the whole point about the planning phase. Then integrating security code scanning, I'll show you um, the GitHub security, um, how you can use that. But the main idea there is update your pipelines, the existing ones you have in build and maybe in uh, deploy stage to integrate security validation. I got Sonar Cloud, that's one example we use in like Azure 400 classes. You got, I don't know, another 75 or 80 out of the, the DevOps marketplace. You grab the tool that you want, you inject it as a task in your pipeline, and that's pretty much it. It's gonna run code scanning validation, which means it's gonna check the packages that your developers are using. It's gonna look for vulnerabilities, and then obviously failing the pipeline to warn you like, hey, watch out, never move this into production. That's one option. Then the peer reviewing, so the approvals, the reviewers we talked about, and then basically repeating the same in each and every cycle. You could start from the development workstation, like running a security tool in Visual Studio VS Code or any other, and then using a second tool in a build pipeline and using a third tool in the deploy pipeline. And then you got the same what we did like 35 years ago already, running an antivirus tool on your local machine and then another antivirus vendor for mail and another antivirus vendor for the file server. Well, now we're still using the same concept. That's what this is all about. And then you got a whole bunch of options. Again, there's, I'll switch to a few last demos. Got 14 minutes to go. Is it lunchtime already? Well, Getting, well, perfect. So why are they leaving? They don't like security anymore? Like, oh my God, DevOps, I need to worry about security. <laughs> Yes, you do. Um, see, they distracted me. What was I gonna show? Oh yeah, the, yeah, I remember, the marketplace. See, that's why people should not leave your session 10 minutes before closing. You search for security in Azure DevOps and you got 140. Don't ask me which of these are good ones, I don't know. I know some of them, I don't know all of them, and I don't think it's that important. Just know that there is a security extension for your pipelines. That's the main message. Some of them, and that's where you need to look into the vendor and the documentation, 
Like I know SNCC, for example, it shows up as the first one, but that doesn't mean anything. But then, for example, if you're using containers, you might look into Aqua because they're specific for scanning containers. Which means if you're not running containers, then scanning something with Aqua doesn't make any sense. That's like the logic behind it. So from here, you would import it, and then it's becoming a task in your pipelines. Or you could use, that's what I had in the slide. For so long, you had OWASP, like an open source, I don't know, grouping that's helping protecting the internet. That's what they do. Every couple of weeks or months, they publish the top 10 vulnerabilities. And they also provide scanning pattern files to loop through those detections. In your runtimes, that's the thing. Where if you look at security scanning, you have static ones and you have dynamic ones. So static or SAST, as the industry calls it, is where you're going to scan non-running code. So basically, on your local development workstation or as part of a pipeline. We have code, but it's not a live running web application, for example, or a function or anything else, where the dynamic one is scanning a live running workload. But you could deploy a web app into your testing environment in Azure subscription one, running a dynamic scan, and it's going to loop through the details and giving you a report like, hey, I detected some security flaws, which means that now you're not allowed to move it into staging and moving it into production. Running that validation could now again be just nothing more than a quality gate validation. Now out of OWASP, it actually moved to a cloud foundation project. And that's the, the one that I have here. Okay, man, attack proxy. This one here. So you, if you still go to OWASP, you're still going to find it, but they moved it, I think, like a bit more than a year ago. But the concept is still the same. So what I did is moving this into a pipeline. Just need to switch oh, my projects. Uh, OWASP. Don't worry that it's called release because it's not a release. Because what it does is just grabbing a Docker container. So on my build agent, the Microsoft hosted one, I installed Docker because at some point when I built this, Docker was not part of that. In the meantime, it is. But then running that OWASP zap. So what it does in short is spinning up a Docker inside your build agent, the virtual machine running the pipeline. It's grabbing the latest overnight zap Python script, and it's connecting to a live running website but not preferably not production, right? Although nothing would block you from running this during your deploy to dev and test staging and still running the same for your production. Although there should not be any security changes from like the vulnerability between dev and test and staging and production, but you never know. Because if you bypass your security model and you allow a push to production, because there's always someone in the company having that permission, right? Then it would still be okay to do that. So that's what this one is, um, is running. And then the outcome of that is nothing more than the pipeline details, where for each and every of the, at this time, OWASP patterns, like 200 some, 170 something scans, it's going to highlight, like, hey, watch out, there's a warning. The funny thing is that they call it HTTP 200, all good. Because the good thing is we found a security vulnerability. So you need to do some reverse thinking there. Like if it's a 200, please don't do anything. And then calling this, I mean, in, in the pipeline itself, it's intelligent that it allows you to define, if you find something, then fail the pipeline. Although in my case, everything's green, but it's still providing me the details because I like having green pipelines, but it's about the message behind it. So that's one, it's a free option. The other one is the GitHub security scanning for Azure DevOps. Why do I like to talk about it? Why do I close with that one? Because again, to me, it's, it's like the, the summary of the whole morning. We have GitHub security that was there since day one, I don't know, like 10 years ago, where any public private project 
or repo at least in GitHub had security scanning. Using Dependabot, using CodeQL, it's their own built-in engine, and it's considered one of the best ones in the industry. I'm not breaking down any of the 140 vendors, but out of like detection, the speed of detecting stuff and how easy it is to use, because it's part of the repo, that's what makes it somewhere in the top um, security options. It allows you to do a lot of security scanning. One of the things that I like about it is that it has integration for different vendors. So this is Azure AWS is in there, Adobe is in there, so many other. So the way it works in short is that each and every, I don't know, cloud vendor or application vendor is handing over their patterns. Like this is what a Azure DevOps personal access token looks like. And we hand over that detection mechanism to GitHub and they scan for it. So depending on the different clouds, it's there. I had an interesting scenario a couple of years ago where um, I told you that I'm quite comfortable in doing service principle demos live because it hasn't any permissions anymore. I used to do the same. It was actually in my probably first three, four months within Microsoft five years ago where I was doing my DevOps class and live showing how to create a service principle and then not paying attention to my learners because it was all virtual. And then somebody managed to grab that token and then putting it in one of their own repos in GitHub. And then on a Thursday evening, I still remember, got a phone call from the Microsoft security team. Now there's only two teams within Microsoft that you don't wanna get a call from. That's the legal team or the security team because it means that you did something wrong, right? So they go like, well, we found one of your security tokens from your Azure DevOps with full permissions on GitHub. And I was like, Puck. <laughs> what did I do? Because I'm like doing my demos like every single week, almost the same topic, right? And I was like, I did not move any tokens into GitHub. But how do you prove that? And then 10 minutes after, I was like, was this actually a security team? Was this like a scam call or something? But then while I was on the phone with the Microsoft security team, I had my manager calling me three, four times. So then I was like getting even more worried because now not only my token was in GitHub and I could lead my project. I mean, it's all demo samples. But on the other side, when your manager starts calling you, it's like, mm -hmm, I really messed up, right? But it was just that when they reached out, they are required to inform your manager. And he was just interested in hearing like, hey, Pete, what happened? So I'm like, well, I don't know. I need to find out. And then eventually they told me and they shared the, the details that, so this person had my token and then sharing it in one of his own repos. So nothing really happened, but on the other side, that's really how scary it can become. Now the way they detected it, and that's the cool thing, is that out of, not the fact that I was like a Microsoft employee and they detected like, oh, this is a Microsoft managed organization in DevOps, it's just default security scanning. So that's the other benefit, I would say. Now from here, so when you go into your GitHub repos, four minutes to go, we can make this. So you go into your repos and I should have one with a few examples. I just don't remember which one. Got way too many of them. So you go into settings you enable security or you go here into security and you just need to enable it. So the feature is there, but you're in control if you wanna use it. Because think back, if you pay for Sonar Cloud, Man, Snake and all the other ones, you're gonna do the same. You're just gonna add a security task as part of your GitHub actions. So they give you the option, but you need to define, do you wanna use the built-in GitHub one or not? So you're gonna flag this. And then based on that, you get like notifications in the portal or you get some email notifications as well. Now this detection mechanism that again, been around in GitHub since day one is now moved into Azure DevOps as well. To do that, you go into your DevOps. You create a pipeline. I don't remember which one I used. This one. It's only two, well actually three tasks. So you have your, I'll make this a bit bigger again. So you got your default task, so this is the built one. 
well, now what I did is injecting a task, code QL initialization, where you need to specify the parameter like, oh, I want you to use this language, which in my case, .NET C Sharp, and it's the same for Java, JavaScript, and Node, and the other ones. Then a little bit further, so you run the traditional build that you always did, and then you're gonna add the actual security dependency scanning and analyzing it. Three tasks. To do this, there's actually two options. So you can go into your uh, project settings. Do I remember? Project settings, some security option. That's it. Yeah, project settings, repos, that's right. How do you remember all that? <laughs> uh, repos, and then you enable security, and you, uh, no, not this one, settings, security, and you're gonna enable it. What it's gonna do there is automatically scanning each and every new repo you create. That's one option. The second option, that's the one I used, <laughs> where you're gonna build it as part of your pipeline. The outcome, like I showed you with the OWASP scenario, for live running is now the same for static code. And again, it's one of the, well, not the 140 options from the marketplace, it's option 141. Again, it's not about one being better than the other, but I think it's still one of the better ones. Running the tasks, running OWASP, um, the other thing I had on here, but we don't have time for it, is um, integrating with Key Vault. So when you have secret variables, you define them as a variable. You got a little key inside DevOps to lock it down and store it encrypted. Or preferably, you're going to create a variable group and integrating it with Key Vault. Now, to do that, you need a service principle or managed identity or the workload identity that's having lockdown permissions in Key Vault because leaving everything wide open is not really gonna help you. And if you wanna play with that, you know at home next week you can do that. I think I got two more minutes, close to two more minutes. I got more swag for the ones who are fast. Feel free to empty the bag, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> and the last one can take the bag as well. I hope you enjoyed it. I need to remind you that at some point, I don't know exactly when it's gonna happen, that feedback is important. I hope you enjoyed the session because it was the first one for the week. I hope you learned something new and it set the tone for the week. If you wanna reach out whenever you want, then send me an email, I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, feel free to stay in touch. And I hope you enjoy the week. I hope to see you again next year. Thank you so much.